bespoke radio for the masses. Headline edition, July 8, 1947. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. If the game is rigged, change the game. Game changer. I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. This is Fade to Black with your host, Jimmy Church, on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. I need your help to get to the year 1985. to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Hey now. Well, well, well. Had to get one last tweet in. This is Fade to Black, bespoke radio for the masses. Today's Wednesday, June 15th. 167 days into the new year. 199 days left. We're live from a bunker. Somewhere in downtown Burbank, California. I'd like to welcome everybody listening all around the world, all across the United States, hither and thither, to and fro, back and forth, up and down, east and west, north and south, far and near. It's Fade to Black. For KJCR, the Game Changer Network, and KGRA, the Planets, I'm your oh so humble host, Jimmy Church. What's cracking, everybody? Let's do this, man. I did that for Ice Cube. It's his birthday today. Still one of the great lines in all of cinema. Man, I love that movie, Friday. When Friday first came out and uh, on DVD, and I had heard about it, I went out and got the DVD. I literally had Friday parties over at the house. I'd have a different group of people over every night. They had never heard of the movie. And we would sit down and watch Friday. And, uh, man, I went through a Friday thing, man, for about a year, maybe two. Love that movie. All right. Uh, I'm in the chair. I'm in the bunker. I'm ready. Are you? Because tonight we have a very special guest with us for the first time. Beth Leone joins the show and she's going to share with us how to unlock your inner badass. We're going to talk about some of that. And I, I, I know what you're thinking. You know, how can somebody, you know, so attractive and and five five black belts? Okay, let's just start there. I, I get that. I get that. She has a lot to say. And more on more on that in just a second. But... We met um, Beth for the first time out of contact in the desert, and and I'm just going to share this with you. Um, uh, we were at the Fader House having a little get together and uh, uh, with everybody, and David Wilcock and Corey Good uh, were invited and showed up, and we were doing night vision, and and they they arrive, and and Beth is with them, and so we go in and and we sit down. And, and Beth just looked like somebody we needed to talk to. It was just like that. And so we, we get the conversation chairs in a circle at one end of the extremely large patio. You've seen the pictures. And Beth holds court for a few hours. And I was like, you know what? That, that, that's it. (laughs) You need, you need to get your, yourself on fade to black and we need to do what we're doing right now for the rest of the world. And that's how it happened. And sometimes synchronicities strike and you react. So tonight, Beth Leone is our guest here on fade to black. I'm very excited about the conversation. 
Tomorrow night is Fader Night with John Rappaport. No more fake newsroom. And then Friday, I'm over at Coast to Coast. And my guest will be Larry Flaxman. You can follow us on Twitter right now at JChurch Radio, Facebook, YouTube. Everything is easy to do. Just go over to the website and click away on all those little icons, those button things that you do with your mouse. You can also email throughout the show tonight. And that is Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. I'm looking at a couple of emails. As I said, that just popped in. See, that's that's what's great. Live radio. Love it, right? Let's do this. The sandbox is hashtag F2B. We don't bite. Any questions or comments during the show for my guest, Beth Leone, or myself, use the hashtag F2BQ. That is fade to black questions. Support the show. Very simple. Support yourself. Easy enough to do. Support our sponsors. Life Change Tea. Get the tea.com. Go to the banner, click on it, use the promo code Jimmy when you check out. Check out all of the great products. One of the great companies on this earth, on the spinning globe. Globe, it's round, it's not flat. This spinning globe that we are on. All of the people around me are on the Life Change Tea program. Everybody. Now it's time for you to join and just go. Go to the specials page. Do what I do. I do the Moringa. I do the Colostrum. I do the Live 365. Uh, that's that's my package. That's what I do. Okay? The tea is amazing. It tastes great. It does. It tastes great. It's dangerous tea, though. See, it's dangerous. You need to get past the, the, the great taste and realize that, you know... <laughs> <laughs> it's a dosage you're taking. Don't, you don't you don't drink that all day long on a hot summer day to quench your thirst. But it tastes like that, and you want to do that. GetTheTea.com, promo code Jimmy when you check out, or over the phone. Just tell them Jimmy sent you. Free shipping on your order. Also, Studio Dome, the best deal on the net is their TWS True Wireless Stereo Package, high-fidelity stereo system, two SBB2 speakers, Hard shell case, power, everything that you need for just $129. Best deal on the net. That is 60% off the normal price of $399. That's right. You get it for $129. And you get free shipping. Just use the promo code JCRTWS. All right. Today's the 15th. So in just a few short days, two weeks, less than two weeks, we're going to be out at Roswell. For the Roswell Festival, June 30th through July 3rd in Roswell, New Mexico. Travis Walton, Don Schmidt, Tom Carey, Peter Robbins, Daryl Sims, Stanton Friedman. It's uh, it's going to be an amazing event. Uh, Clyde Lewis is going to be there. Clyde is going to broadcast on Thursday night from the museum. We're going to broadcast on Friday night from the museum. You're going to want to be there. It's a it's a weekend long of events. And, you know, you want to be with me when we go out to the crash site, because we're going to do that, too, as well. And if you are a fade or not and you want to go to the Roswell Festival and you want to help us out, we need to build a fade or not team to help uh, for the broadcast. Contact us. Contact me. Contact Rita. And you're not going to get paid but you're going to get a really, really cool fade to black crew shirt <laughs> and we'll feed and drink you and, uh, and we'll get you passes, you know, we'll do all of that. So if you can, if you can attend and work, I mean like really work, you're going to break a sweat. You're really going to work, but you get to hang out. All right. So contact us, contact Rita, just go over to the website, send Rita an email and, uh, you know, undoubtedly we'll know who you are. All right. Roswell Festival, June 30th. Awareness Life Expo, Crown Plaza Hotel, Sacramento, California, August 13th and 14th. And I think it's at the, the 12th, is it? Rita, send, send me the information. I, I, it's three days. The Friday before, private, uh, uh, private uh, mixer that we're going to be broadcasting from that Friday night. 
So you're definitely going to want to attend that. And then, of course, it's Saturday and Sunday at the Crown Plaza Hotel. Richard Dolan, Lori McDonald, Victor Camacho, Patty Greer, Holly, Holly Cook, Len Caston. You're going to want to be there. It's going to be a great, great event. And the Crown Plaza has always got a good bar. All right. Let's get the show cracking. Yeah, today. I already announced it. Ice Cube today is 47. I'm going to fire up Twitter. King Jimmy needs, needs a drink tester at Roswell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a... That'll, that'll get a that'll, Tammy. That'll get a retweet every single time. Now I, I want to fire up Twitter really quick. What's your favorite Ice Cube song? What's your favorite? <laughs> I know mine. And it and you know what? I should almost say it better come off of death certificate, or you're gonna have to stand in the corner. All right. I want to know. I want to see how cool the Fader Knots really are. What's your favorite Ice Cube song? It could, uh, yeah, we can go NWA, I suppose. You know, we, we might be able to go there. Ice Cube today is only 47 years old. Jim Belushi today is 62. Jim Belushi makes the cut because he made one of the great UFO CIA movies of all time, Real Men. And if you haven't seen Real Men, check it out because that is, is an authentic UFO documentary. Our dead guy's birthday today is Jim Varney, 1949 to 2000. Died at the age of 50. Unbelievable. Played Ernest Worrell in the Ernest film series. You know, Ernest goes to camp. Slam dunk Ernest. Love that one. Ernest goes to jail. It's one of my favorites. Ernest scared stupid. One of the best. Ernest in the army. Pretty epic. But before the movie biz, he met with and met up with advertising executive John R. Cherry III. And before all of the mayhem kicked off, and he turned Ernest P. Worrell into a cash cow. They made commercials for just about everybody in the Midwest and the Mid-South and the South. For clients ranging from soft drinks, food stores, and eventually Disney. And in Indiana where I first saw uh, Ernest, it was for Linder's Ice Cream. And if you're from Indiana and you hear my voice, you remember Jim Varney uh, doing his Vern stuff with the uh, Linder's Chocolate Shakes. I remember it well. Rest in peace, Jim. Happy birthday. I on this day in history, 1215. 1215. Magna Carta was sealed. Following a revolt by the English nobility against his rule, King John puts his royal seal on the Great Charter. Yeah. Pave the way for a democracy. Sort of. Anton Oz, he just tweets out, smoke some weed. What, 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 what does that mean? Right now? You mean like now? Smoke weed during the show? One of these days I'll do it. One of these days, I'll smoke some weed on the air for you guys. We'll have somebody stop by the bunker with a bong. Remember in the old days when you would ride around in a car and you would submarine, right? And you'd smoke all that weed with the windows up. Remember that? <laughs> I never did it. But I heard, I heard about it. But that's what that would be like here in the bunker, man, because there's no windows. It's sealed. It would just be... All right, Les Johnson comes in with no Vaseline. That's my that's it. Les, that'll get a that'll get a that'll get a retweet right there. That's a that's a hell of a song. <laughs> Rita just said she can stop by right now. What's going on down the hall, Rita? <laughs> What's go hot box in the sandbox? God. You guys know all this terminology. How do you know about this weed? called clam bake where do you guys hot box where do you guys how do you guys know about this stuff you know that stuff is you know it's illegal the mary joe wanna isn't it isn't it <laughs> you guys are potheads ever hot boxing yeah yeah remember those days and then you know the funny thing is is and it happened and i know all of you have the same story but 
you got pulled over by the police. You guys are rolling down the road, submarining, hotboxing, windows up, just toasted, you know, three, four joints, high as hell, and you get pulled over, and you try to act like nothing's going on, and you got to roll down that window. <laughs> oh, man, not in Oregon, says Danae. Oh, Okay. All right, how do, how do how, wait, 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 see what Ice Cube just did? The best line, though, in, in Friday, since we're talking about weed. The best line, I'm going to get you high today. <laughs> it's Friday. Yeah, man. All right, where where are we? This is a show, folks, this is a show about um, knowledge, consciousness, ufology, time travel, the Illuminati, the New World Order. That's what this show was about. It's not about weed. How did we start talking about weed? People are going to think I'm 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 a weed guy. And I'm a weed guy. <laughs> oh, now we got the All right, all right. Moving on because now the Cheech and Chong pictures are now flying through Twitter. Okay. All right. Where am I? On this day in history, fader fact. A Finnish soldier from Finland, you know, Finnish does that mean he's sort of from Finland? <laughs> he was Finnish. <laughs> he, he lived on the border. He, he, he was both. And in this case, it applies. A Finnish soldier fought for Finland, the Nazis, and the U.S. Army Special Forces. He escaped a, P a POW camp, earned a bronze star, five purple hearts, and then after all of that, he disappeared in Vietnam in 1965 and was never heard from again. That is a fader fact. Tonight, very special guest, Beth Leon, is here. Get ready. It's going to be an amazing conversation. Tomorrow night is fader night. John Rappaport is no more fake newsroom. The call in number tonight is 323-825-5045. And I have the feeling I'm going to have to say right now, uh, tonight's going to be ladies' night on the phones. I can already feel that coming. All right. Now, I'm going to take a hit of this coffee because a weird press release went out today. Check this out. Mm. Love coffee. I wonder if Beth Leone drinks coffee. She's a health freak and uh, nothing wrong with that. But, I mean, can you drink coffee and be healthy? Yeah, that's, a, that's a good question. Well... You don't expect right now, apparently, to see Donald Trump sit down with Seth, Seth Myers anytime soon. Myers banned the Donald from his show last night in sol solidarity with the Washington Post. Apparently, Trump revoked the newspaper's press access at his campaign events earlier this week. And I was shocked. I was shocked that Seth Myers would, well, wait a minute. It's kind of funny, but I read the press release and I didn't know that Seth Myers had a show. <laughs> I didn't. And well, wait a minute. I got to take it a step further here. Who is Seth Myers? I don't know who Seth Myers is. Apparently, he's somebody somewhere because it did a press release about him banning Donald Trump. And I'm like, Seth Myers? Who, who, who is Seth Myers? I think I've heard the name before, right? I'm, I'm sure that I have. And I'm sure that the Donald is saying the same thing right now like me. He's saying, oh, wait, I know. I know. I know that guy, right? Seth Myers. Didn't he didn't he write Family Guy? That's what I'm thinking. That that's that's who we're talking about, right? Or was that wait, was that Seth Rogan? Right? That was Seth Rogan that wrote Family Guy. I'm I'm confused. Wait. Okay, wait. I think that wasn't Seth Rogan. That was Jonah Jonah Hill. Am I right? Jonah and Seth are the same person, right? I'm, am I wrong? 
I'm getting confused, but his name, oh, Jonah and Seth, his name isn't Seth. Jonah, though, has a TV show, right? Is that, am I zoning in here? Am I, am I getting close? Who was I talking about? The family guy, dude. Um, his name was McFarland. So why would Seth Hill ban Trump from the family guy? It's Jonah Hill, right? Seth Rogen. I, I'm confused. I didn't know that he... I, I don't even know what the show is. Oh, wait. I. It's Lauren Hill. Lauren Hill. But that doesn't make any sense. Why would Lauren Hill ban Donald Trump? I, I, I don't get it. I don't know what the press release was about. But I guess... I guess we can go with this. Don't worry. Seth Hill, Jonah, Myers, Rogan. I don't think that Donald knows who you are either. Or has any plans on trying to find out if you have a show or what the name of it is. As for me, during the commercial break, I'm going to use Google. Oh, wait, I get it. Doesn't Joe Rogan have a show? Right? Is that who we're talking about? I'm not sure if he does, but if Rogan did, he would definitely ban Trump. And that would be real news. Yeah. Seth, Seth, Seth Myers. What is somebody, can somebody tweet out really quick because I'm smoking weed right now and I just don't know who this Seth Myers guy is. What's his TV show? Does he have a TV show? And what was this press release about? And should I be, should, should, should I Google during the break? I, now, for some of the news that you know nothing about, I don't know why, but Twitter has finally given in and allowing users to retweet themselves. No longer will users have to rely on others to amplify their views through their, you know, their retweets of other people's posts. They can now merrily retweet their own opinions <laughs> that nobody cares about and that nobody asked for. There's no third party needed anymore. Self retweets even count towards the total retweet tally as well, making self retweeters feel even more self-gratified. It's kind of narcissistic, isn't it? At the same time, the at messages will show up for everyone who follows a particular feed. Not only the recipient, but the people who follow both the tweeter and the recipient. Tweets made in direct reply to previous tweets, starting with an at reply, will remain using the old system. However, your feed won't be filled with back-to-back -back and back-and-forth conversations unless you follow both recipients. Did you understand that, potheads? Because I didn't. All right. In other big Twitter news, Twitter's Periscope is finally taking flight off of the network. Now listen to me. Check this out. The update means Periscope videos will be viewable live across the web instead of simply nestled within Periscope's app and on Twitter feeds. That change will increase the, the reach of Periscope video and Twitter hopes that it will be more engaging for video creators who have recently been favoring competitors like, of course, Facebook, YouNow, and Snapchat. I think it's amazing, and I'm glad that they did it. And speaking of that, as I said, all of this uh, negative Twitter news, my Twitter just crashed <laughs> right now. It just crashed. Do you think, you know, I've got friends at Twitter. They wouldn't do that to me, would they? Wow. Bizarre. A U.S. attorney plans to bring evidence before a federal grand jury to determine whether charges will be brought against Noor Salman, the widow of Orlando nightclub gunman and doofus and dipshit Omar Mateen. Noor Salman has told investigators that Mateen told her he had interest in carrying out an attack 
and then went on a trip with him to buy ammo. And now she's claiming innocence, that she didn't know anything of any specific plans. But I got news for you, Noor. Uh, you're guilty. <laughs> you, right now, today, if you're going to strike a deal, you strike a deal today. That's what you do. You are guilty, and that's the end of that. You cannot claim uh, innocent. You can't say that you're a good person. You can't say that you've never done any because you knew something was up. You go hang out with the guy that's your husband that you claim was completely insane, and you go with him to buy ammo, and he's talking about shooting up a joint. You don't go call the police, and then it's on you. You're guilty, and there's no getting out of it. There are very, very specific laws. You're not going to be able to get up in front of a judge and go, look, I know. I know I did, up, but, but you know, I, I, I'm really a good person. No, you're not. No, you are not. And every judge in this country hears the same story from people like you. I didn't know I was driving the getaway car. I thought we were going to get a pizza. You're guilty. <laughs> That's it. He, he, when he borrowed the gun from me, he said he was going to go rabbit hunting. You're guilty. All right. Led Zeppelin guitarist Jimmy Page testified today here in Los Angeles, that until a few years ago, <laughs> and I love Jimmy Page, but it's it's not looking good. He said that until a few years ago, he had never heard a song that the band is accused of ripping off for Stairway to Heaven. He said it on the stand today in front of an eight-member jury. They're hearing the copyright infr infringement case in federal court, and jurors must decide whether the two sequences are are similar. And that's it. Just similar. Not the same. Similar. That's the key word. Earlier in the day, former Spirit band member Mark Andes testified that the riffs from both songs played by an acoustic guitarist on a video aired in court were the same. Page says he never heard the song. But in his testimony, Andy said that Spirit played Taurus, the song in question, in 1968 at a Denver show in Colorado where Zeppelin was the opening act. <laughs> Ouch. Oh, man, I love me my Zeppelin, but it ain't looking good. It's just not. The key word here is similar. That's, that's all a jury's got to do, just similar, not the same. And you know what? This is the hard part. They're not similar. They're the same. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. I'll be back in a few minutes with Beth Leone. Tomorrow night, open lines, fader night with John Rappaport. Then Friday night, I'm over at Coast to Coast AM with Larry Flaxman. This is Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and KGRA, The Planet. I'll be right back. Stay right there. Listening to Jimmy Church fade to black. Fade to black will now pause for alien identification. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. What's up, revolutionaries? It's me, Jimmy Church. Do you have an IRS or state tax issue? Well, I did, and I called national tax experts. My problems were fixed, done, fini, and man, I got to tell you, it was a relief. National tax experts are a recognized tax office that services clients in all 50 states. It doesn't matter where you live. Give them a call. I'm telling you, they take the time to understand each and every client's individual financial status as well as their financial goals. And that's exactly what you need, my brother, when you're taking on the evil three letter. So, seriously. Give them a call today at 1-877-909-5444. Again, 1-877-909-5444. Or go check out their website, 
www.nattaxexperts.com. That's N A T T A X E X P E R T S dot com. Tell them Jimmy sent you. Health in America is becoming a top priority. Or maybe I should say, good health in the world is becoming a top priority. Maintaining a healthy body can be challenging. How about letting life change tea help you? Our tea, you make, you drink, and you benefit. Our unique blend of eight different herbs helps you maintain good digestion, a healthy colon, and detoxes harmful toxins and parasites out of your body. And you know what? It tastes great. If you're wanting a change, a life change when it comes to health, Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Or you can call us at 928-308-0408. That's 928-308-0408. When you log on to our mobile-friendly website, you can read all the numerous testimonies of how Life Change Tea has helped so many people. We carry many, many beneficial products that help your health and keep you on track. GetTheTea.com. Kind of gets in your head, doesn't it? GetTheTea.com. Nine out of ten geneticists agree. Fade to Black is not your father's radio show. On the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the planet. Hi, this is Chase Klutzke with Fate Magazine Radio, and you're listening to Jimmy Church and Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA digital broadcast station, where the Fade or Nots rock. Hi, this is Rob Reiner from Anvil, and you're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. What's up? I'm Chris. What up? This is Kyle Massey, and you're listening to Jimmy Church Radio. All right, welcome back, Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow us on Twitter at J Church Radio. Email is Jimmy at JimmyChurchRadio.com. Very simple. Any questions for myself or Beth tonight, use the hashtag F2BQ. Questions will feed to me directly into the studio in real time. She joins us tonight for the first time, and she's going to share with us how to unlock your inner badass, which sounds intimidating at first, but but there's a journey that she had to get there, and it's going to be a wide-open conversation, so get ready. And tomorrow night's Fader Night open lines with uh, John Rappaport and his No More Fake Newsroom, and then Friday night, I'm over at Coast to Coast AM with Larry Flaxman. But tonight, it's about Beth. And she shares the keys to unlock your inner badass superpowers. Her mission is to help empower a new race of superhumans who embody love, power, pleasure, and protect beauty here on Earth. In order to transform a life-threatening illness, she devoted her life to embodying wisdom from ancient lineages, including shamanism, martial arts, and sacred sexuality. She earned five black belts in Shaolin Kung Fu and became became the first female master instructor in her martial art lineage. She has created programs to assist this ascension process. She has authored two books on uh, Qi Gong and is currently working on her next book about sacred partner alchemy. Her website is BethLeon.net. You can get there by just clicking on her name over at JimmyChurchRadio.com. And I would like to welcome to Fade to Black, Beth Leone. Beth, good evening. How are you? I'm doing great, Jimmy. Thank you. Uh, no, no. The pleasure is all mine tonight mm-hmm. and, and ours, of course. And, and thank you for this. And now <clears throat> there's a few different things that we've got to get out of the way first. And the first thing is you get the first time guest disclaimer, Beth. And that is this is just you and I sitting on my couch having a conversation as friends. We're going to go where we go. We're going to end where we end, but we're going to end as friends. Are you ready? I am. All right. Now, uh, I I, 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 I want to start here, actually. I just stuttered because uh, <laughs> it's really funny. 
um, you got to hang out with the Fader Knots over at Contact in the Desert. And there was probably 30 or 40 of them there. And you got to talk to them. And it's a smart bunch of uh, people, right? And you and I talked about that that night, right? Yes, they are. Yeah. Love the Fader Knots. Well, I found out tonight in Twitter that they're all a bunch of potheads. <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, one one word of the weed, and I just found out. That, <laughs> well, they're following the leader, that, right? <laughs> oh man, I'm a little, you know. So as uh, so, I guess the word is out. You know, they're smart, smart pot, potheads, but smart uh, potheads, yeah, love it. Yeah, right. right. <laughs> so um, we we uh, we met on on uh, that Saturday night in. Oh no, I'm sorry, it was Sunday night at. Contact in the desert. And there was a lot of weird things that happened out of contact. There was lots of sightings in the skies. Um, uh, lots of knowledge was going around and the, and the, and, and, you know, the, the vibe, you know, it was a great gathering of people, but it seemed to embody a little bit of everything. You had the knowledge, uh, you had uh, great speakers, food, everybody gathered, but then we had all those sightings in the sky. We had the blue blinker. Yeah, that was absolutely nuts. Did you, <laughs> did you, um, and David and Corey happen to? I mean, you saw stuff when you were with us well, that night, that this Sunday. This is really but. interesting. So David and I were having a conversation at the kitchen table, and I saw this blue light come into the room right at the level of the lamp. And I asked David, I said, "Do you ever see things like energy beings or anything?" And he said, "Well, sometimes." And so I just didn't say anything. And then immediately after that, he got a text from Corey and Corey said, look outside. And so we're like, well, look outside. So we go outside. We didn't really see anything. And Corey's like, go look outside. Go look outside. So we turn all the lights off in the house and we go outside. And when our eyes, eyes finally adjusted, we saw this blue blinking light in the sky. And we watched it for a little bit to see if it was moving or if it was staying in the same place. And it was moving very slowly to the left in the sky. And it wasn't moving fast. We could see other airplanes in the sky and they were moving very fast. And the blue blinker was blinking this blue flashing light really slow, kind of bobbling around a little bit. And it went to the left and then it went up and then it went to the right. And we got tired of watching it for a while and then went back inside. Interesting. And there were uh, hundreds, if not thousands of people that were seeing the same thing th that you and David witnessed. Yeah. What does that tell you? I mean, I, I, I know that Joshua Tree is a special place, so we, we have that going for us, right? Yes. <laughs> you know, it's a special place. But that was something that it wasn't an, an anomaly that one person was walking around contact saying that they saw something the night before. Everybody saw this stuff. Yes, and they knew that it was blue and that it was blinking. And what, is, what does that tell you? What do you think? Was it a message for, for us? You know, well, I feel that there must be some sort of communication and interaction going on between us and the extraterrestrials. And I think that that says that they're not out of communication with us. People were there, like, you know, playing their singing bowls and chanting, you know, at night. And I'm sure they're very happy that they, they felt they called one in. And, yeah, I, for me, and, and I know I shared it with you and I've shared it with the world a few times now, but uh, for myself and Rita to go through that like we did with so many people, um, it was reassuring that, and I know this kind of sounds strange, but that we weren't crazy, right? <laughs> because there were other witnesses there. And now we can lean on each other for support and certainly turn to the person next to you and the person next to them go, Did, okay, are we all seeing the same thing? You know, yes. are, are we in a dream here? Or is everybody on the same page? Because right now there's craziness going on in the skies. And fortunately, we have all of us for support. Yes, that was essentially a mass sighting. It, it was a, a mass sighting. And there was a, I just read this report today about a pilot in San Bernardino uh, that reported uh, playing uh, cat and mouse with a blue orb. 
in the sky, which is not that far from Joshua Tree. And that was on June 5th, the night after the sightings. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah, June 5th was the night that uh, we all got together. That was June 5th. And so, and we had the sighting uh, uh, that night. Well, we saw a few things uh, that night before you got there. Well, there was things going on while you guys were there too as well. But uh, we saw something in the skies, which would have been, heading in the direction of San uh, Bernardino. And I watched that for a few minutes uh, with Richard Dolan. Very strange. So I don't know. I don't know. It's just interesting uh, that it happened and we just had all of those witnesses at the same time. I, I think there's something that is uh, uh, my gut is telling me that that was just a, a, a wink. You know, they were winking at us saying, okay, check this out. We're literally. Here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Literally just just uh just saying that we're there and 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 you guys are cool that's what i think that was like yeah, like yeah. A, like a reward <laughs> i think so too it felt very sweet yes very sweet energy to it yes yes there was nothing negative at all yeah that's a good way to put it okay uh let's see let's let's kind of start here because with um uh, it's the first time on the show. This is a large audience, and uh, most, unless they follow you, have never heard your story before. And I did something that I don't normally do uh, with somebody at uh, contact. When I yelled across the party, I yelled at you and said, Beth, come over here. Yes. Uh, you look like we're going to have a great conversation. And you sat down, and then that's what we did. We took off running. Mm -hmm. And you told me... Uh, uh, some stories or a little bit about your background. And I cut you off that night. And I said, look, I want to save this for fade to black. And I cut you off. Let's, let's save that. So what started your journey and what was your family like growing up? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you the first memory that I ever had. And when I was three years old is when my consciousness came online and I, I could hear my own thoughts and understand what they were. So I was in the car with my mother, and we were driving down the road, and I was looking out the window of the car at the road and all of the, the strip malls and the concrete, and I just thought to myself, what have they done? And it was a, a perception like this beautiful planet, all this amazing technology, this is what they've done with it? And that really was like a defining moment for my entire life, because as a child, I felt really out of place. And I was really sensitive, and I saw auras, and I saw spirit beings, and I had spirit beings speaking to me. Um, I would fall into trance over graves, and I would communicate with, there was one you know, Indian that was my best friend, and, and I remember my mother calling me out of that trance, and I remember being really sad that I had to go back to my parents. <laughs> my mom is probably listening to this, but she, they've never heard these stories yet. So I had to go back to my parents and I felt like they didn't understand me. They didn't know me. And it was this sense like, wow, they're my parents. I really have to be with them and they don't even understand who I am. So my, I had this dual life. I was a very sensitive child and I grew up in a, a broken home. My father um, was not with us in our household since I was three. Hey, hey Beth, let me, I'm going to stop you yeah. right there. Yeah, you're moving the mic around. Try not to move the mic around. The, I'll try not to. Yeah, it's the, stuck on my face in an interesting way. <laughs> yeah, I, I understand. It's just okay. uh, it's your volume is going up and down. That's all. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Continue. All right. So I came from a broken home, and my mother was manic depressive, and my brother was pretty violent toward me. So that gave me a lot of uh, distance. Really, I a lot of soul loss in the shamanic sense where the soul separates from the body a little bit in order to deal with the trauma. And so I had even more paranormal experiences happening. And I had a lot of these experiences go on until I was about 14, until they got much worse, where things would fly across the room and break in symmetrical patterns on the floor. And I was seeing spirits quite often um, at the foot of my bed in the middle of the night. And I got down on my knees one particular moment it was when I was home alone and the radio was fizzing and you know like I went over to it to try to get back to the radio station and it was all that white noise and I heard this sound in the kitchen like something you know 
sliding off of a counter and flying and then this breaking noise on the floor and I turned around and there were these three butter dishes that had flown about 10 feet broken on the kitchen floor in a symmetrical geometric pattern. And at that very moment, I went over back by the couch. I got down on my knees and I prayed to God. I said, please take this away from me. And, and it did. It went away from me. I didn't see ghosts anymore. I didn't hear them. And the psychokinetic energy or activity stopped. And then six months later, I became bulimic. I developed an eating disorder. So when I was a child, I stopped talking to people around age five because when I would look at them, I would see their aura and I would see all this energy around them and I could hear their thoughts and what would come out of their mouth was so different than what I was really reading from them that it was just jarring for me. So I stopped talking to people and I said I would only talk to animals because when I looked at animals, they saw me and they could understand me and it was very simple and clear and clean. So that was my childhood. I didn't really have a lot of friends when I was on the playground in preschool. I, I didn't like the harsh energy from the other kids because when they would play, they would say mean things. And so I would go sit by the teacher and I would just sit right by her side and not say anything. And that was my protection so that people wouldn't bother me. <laughs> so I was very isolated and uh, I was really emotionally truncated. I was emotionally wounded, I didn't really talk that much, and that went on all throughout junior high, all throughout high school. I was deathly shy. Uh, if I even did talk to somebody, I'd usually blush. I, I could not get up in front of a stage and say anything. And so I became bulimic at age 15. And that really defined my life for five years. I became severely bulimic. And at the time, I was also a national track runner. So I excelled in track and I excelled in school. I was in the uh, advanced placement courses. I was taking college courses in high school. Um, I didn't hang out with the girls in high school because they would talk about other people and that felt really damaging to me and I didn't like to talk about other people. So I would go up to the library with all the geeks and at least we could talk about interesting things, you know, whatever we were reading in history and stuff like that. So um, interestingly enough, my grandma had a dream. I was actually living in Colorado Springs um, at the time with my aunt because my mother and stepfather had moved down to Phoenix. So I was living with my aunt my junior year, I believe, and my, my grandmother has this dream. And in the dream, she uh, we're, at, we're out to eat, and I go into the bathroom, and then she goes into the bathroom after me, and then she opens the door, and there I am throwing up. So my grandma calls my mom, and she says, I think Bethy throws her food up. And my mom, being a nurse, she's a nurse practitioner, you know, uh, she got very worried. She called me up and she said, do you throw up your food? <laughs> and so I, you know, I had to admit to it at that point. I got called on it. So I said, yeah. Um, and then I just hid it. I continued to hide it. It, it got worse and worse. I moved in with my grandma. I moved in with another friend. So my life was really um, up in the air and my bulimia was getting worse and worse. My mom got really worried and she came to school one day. She drove up from Phoenix to Colorado and she took me out of school um, just like that. No warning, no nothing. She showed up at school <laughs> and that was it. And so I left my senior year of high school and I went to the hospital in Arizona. And so this was when the, they had just opened up hospitals for eating disorders. They hadn't had hospital programs yet. So there I was, locked in a room with an IV in my arm, um, with anorexics and bulimics and overeaters. It was just an entire eating disorder ward, essentially. And they start, you know, talking about my dreams and having me do art therapy and then locking us in a room to eat bad hospital food and then locking us back into our room. And really what happened is when I got out of that, I was there for about six weeks. And when I got out of that, I was actually worse. And I felt really ashamed. I couldn't tell my mother. My mother had spent you know $10,000 at the time and, and I couldn't tell her that I hadn't gotten better. 
And so I hit it for the rest of my senior year. And um, then well, let I, me let me jump in right there. We're gonna yeah. take we're gonna take a break, okay. and uh, and we're also during the break we're gonna switch over to uh, phone lines. Okay, so just get ready for that, and uh, and w uh, we're gonna reset. Okay? okay, so let's do that now. Our guest tonight is Beth Leon. This is Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with Beth right after this short break. Stay with us. Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. The station that talks the net. KGRA Radio. Hello, I'm Kathleen and you're listening to my main man, Jimmy Church on JimmyChurchRadio.com. Hi, this is Ray Sobs here repping the planet and you're listening to my good friend, Jimmy Church, Fade to Black on the Game Changer Network and the KGRA Digital Broadcast Station. What would your life be like if you woke up each morning with new vitality, feeling better than you have in years, and you noticed the difference in your sleeping patterns, blood sugar levels, and had a sense of well-being overall? There's something that is changing thousands of people's lives, and you could be one of them. It's called Heart and Body Extract. Sharon Harris, co-creator of Heart and Body Extract, talks about the positive effects of this product. What happens with the formula Heart and Body Extract is it's giving the body the necessary vitamins, minerals, amino acids, enzymes, and phytonutrients so the body will heal itself. And yes, the body does have the ability to balance blood pressure, balance cholesterol, clean and unclog the arteries. It can also work on balancing the circulation for diabetics. So the body is an amazing thing. It simply needs some help so it has the tools to heal itself. To order your two-month supply, call now toll-free 866-295-5305. Order online at hbextract.com. Imagine no longer being tied down to your computer, but having the freedom to take live talk radio with you anywhere you go. TalkStream Live introduces our first ever iPhone application. The talk shows you follow now follow you. And your iPhone is now the fastest and easiest way to stay connected to the best talk radio on the Internet. Let TalkStream Live transform the way you listen to radio. Listen to live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Mobile talk radio from TalkStream Live. Now available in the iTunes App Store. This is Toby Kebble. You're listening to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Don't hurt me, Jimmy. I'm only little. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And this is Ari Gold. We're of the Honey Brothers. <laughs> we are of the Honey Brothers. Hey, I'm Adrian Grenier. And I'm Ari Gold. We're the Honey Brothers. And you're listening to Jimmy Church. The Revolution. What's up, Fader Knots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full range boom boxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this, it's amazing. It's just 129 bucks and use the promo code JCRTWS and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple, just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner, go back Lee Tepe. This is Micah Hanks of the Graylian Report, and you're listening to Jimmy Church on Fade to Black. Across the globe on the Game Changer Radio Network and the one and only KGRA Radio, the planet.
Welcome back. Fade to black. Beth Leone shares keys to unlock your inner badass superpowers. Her mission is to help empower a new race of superhumans who embody love, power, pleasure, and protect the beauty here on planet Earth. All right. Now, Beth, right before the break, uh, we were talking, uh, you were telling us about uh, the hospital, IVs in your arm, and you you were about to share what happens next. Okay. Can you hear me good? Oh, you are perfect. Awesome. So, yes, I'm in the hospital. They've got IVs in my arm. They lock me in a room at night. I'm in there with anorexics, bulimics, overeaters. It's the first time that they have uh, hospital experiences for eating disorders. This was in, like, 1987. And they lock us in a room to eat. We eat bad hospital food. They, uh, they lock us back in our room after we eat so that we don't go to the bathroom and throw it up. But even still, I found a way to throw out my food in the hospital. So um, I was just getting away with it. So I, w- I definitely was not ready to heal yet. I was still under my parents' roof, and there was probably still some dynamics there, still some rebellion. By the way, my mother is a delightful woman, and she, she got on um, antidepressants, and that really changed her life a, a lot. Um, so the hospital, so I, I, I get discharged from the hospital and, and it was, I just got worse actually. It didn't get better. And that was really depressing to me. So I, um, yeah, I go back to school. I finish out my last six months in, in Arizona. And that's also when I got exposed to shamanism for the first time. So I was listening to Jim Morrison, and Jim Morrison starts talking about the shaman. And it just really struck me in the heart. I I just, I just, it's like I could feel something there. So I immediately went to the library, and I checked out the only book on shamanism, and it was by Shirley Nichols. And I read that book from, you know, cover to cover as quickly as I could. And as I was reading that book, I got so excited because everything they were talking about, seeing spirits, doing soul healings, traveling into the other dimension, um, you know, taking out spiritual darts and all this stuff. That, that's how I saw life. And so I was so excited. I knew that in that type of lineage, they would know how to heal the soul. And I had defined that it was my soul that was sick because I was smart. I had a 4.3 GPA. I tested out a calculus in high school. Um, I was a national track runner. I was in the Junior Olympics, the only white girl in the Junior Olympics. Meanwhile, I'm I'm puking my eyeballs out five times a day. What did it do? Uh, what not- and yeah, what did it do to you physically? <laughs> Certainly, your muscles freak out because they're not getting nourishment, and and you're um, you're an athlete and you're smart, but now your brain also is probably starting to get affected too as well. How were you physically at this point? I was 123 pounds solid muscle with 10% body fat. And I, um, but what, what it did do was I do believe it stunted my growth. I, I really think that I would be taller if I hadn't done that because I started my period at about 14 and a half and I had my period for six months. And then I became, I was, I was training so hard and it was, it was this, complex. I was training in track and I discovered that I was really good at it. So I, I, ran, I, I ran back one every race in Colorado. So, I, you know, up until state and I was like third in state in the 400, the most grueling, you know, event you can run. And, um, I, you know, I do think that it, it was it obviously was hard on my body and somehow my gene was just very strong, you know, right, gene right. is what your, you know, blood plus energy. Um, I began to, I began to heal myself. Like I would, I would kind of, you know, destroy myself and heal myself. So I would, I would lay my hand on my throat and I would send white light to my throat and I would regenerate myself. So I was doing this while I was breaking myself down. Um, I'm sure it affected everything, uh, but it just kept me in a really dark box. And I, yeah, I stunted my growth because all my hormones stopped at about 15. So I stopped having my period. And then my body is the same size 
that it was when I was 15. Wow. And I didn't get my, <laughs> yeah, I didn't grow since then. And also to, in 1970 or 1987, 1988, to read a book on shamanism, uh, it was a weird period for that because we had the expansion of consciousness that happened in, you know, in the 2000s up until now, 2016. And then you had the earlier movements of consciousness and, and that in, in the early 70s. But in 87, 88, d did you find a community to go and get into? Was was there something active? It, it, you understand what I'm saying? It was kind of a weird period. I do. Well, no, yeah, nobody was a shaman in 1987, and now everybody's a shaman. Right, right. A shaman this and a shaman that, right? Everyone's a shaman. But back then, like, you know, you were weird if you were a shaman. And so I was a closet shaman for many years. I didn't tell anybody I did it. I did it like, you know, I did my own practice, and I would, you know, kind of like work with somebody every now and then, you know, doing soul retrieval and things. Um, it was not popular at all. But what I did find was the Foundation for Shamanic Studies. They were the only game in town, and I was very happy to find them because Michael Harner, who was an anthropologist, he was down in South America in the 60s with the Shipibo Kanibo and the Hivaro, and he was researching their culture, and he got very interested in their religion. So he starts asking them all these questions about their religion, and they say, well, you know, if you really want to know about our religion, <laughs> drink this. <laughs> right. And, you know... So he drinks, he drinks ayahuasca. And so he has this intense ayahuasca experience where he almost dies, and they actually have to give him antidotes and everything. Right. You're going to find this interesting. Here's something really interesting. So he goes through this experience. He survives, and he, his mind is blown open into the spirit world. And so he, he says he's got to talk about his vision to somebody. So they go out into the forest and meet this blind shaman deep into the forest. So Michael Harner is talking to this blind shaman in the Amazon jungle, and he's telling him about his experience. And he said, and there was this time where these dragon beings were falling out of the sky, and they said that they were the rulers of this planet. And the blind shaman says, oh, they're always saying that. <laughs> <laughs> I find that really interesting. The dragon beings are reptilians. Right, right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, I think you and I talked about this uh, already, but um, we, Rita and I, have been interested in this for a while now. We haven't crossed the line. Certainly we study it and I interview people all the time. We haven't crossed the line of that type of expansion of consciousness okay we haven't gone there but what we did do and it's interesting that you just said that because we read hundreds of accounts from different uh people that went through the experience either with dmt or ayahuasca directly and read their accounts and it doesn't matter if it's a, a different country a different state a different person or whatever they are all consistently having nearly the very same experience communicating and seeing the same uh beings and goddesses and 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 so forth there is something to it that you can't discount everybody having the very same or virtually the exact same experience there is another dimension out there and there's no question about it yes and the foundation for shamanic studies has now been mapping non-ordinary reality for over 20, maybe 20 years. And so they're compiling maps just of this people who are describing the terrain, the levels, the beings that they find there, and they're finding the same thing. And the, the so, yeah, well, I, I don't mean to cut you off, but the, no, the, the comments about reptilians and snakes um, and the communication that they have with them, it happens over and over and over again. And you can't not have that experience. It's going to happen to you. Am I right? If you take ayahuasca. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're you're in for a journey, that's for sure. And you're okay. In for the journey. And and uh, I I'm assuming now that you have. I have. Okay. Times. How many? Seventy. 
70 times. And so uh, not to uh, make this all about ayahuasca, but uh, but I am curious. Um, but was is is that is that journey that you take on ayahuasca? Is it controllable? It, I, can you choose the path? Can you choose who you meet and who you can uh, converse with? Or is all of this given to you? It's very interesting. It's, it's a little of both. How so? Mm, there's a bit of just viewing and listening to what's happening and being present and allowing your perception to open up into this world and allowing the spirit of the plants to guide you. So there's there's definitely a spirit involved and one of the arts of working with ayahuasca is to honor and trust the spirit and to allow the spirit to do the work that it knows how to do because this is the spirit that made the shaman. Right. This is the spirit that taught the master shamans. And so at a certain point, there's a humility and a, and a trust like a little baby that you gain with it where you just offer yourself and, and you just say, do what you need to do. Right, right, right. And after uh, your first, uh, let's go back to the the first experience because you, you you're reading, you're learning, you've you've now met a shaman, you're starting to experience things, um, and then you take your first journey um, on ayahuasca. Um, well, there's a big time gap in between all of this. I didn't I didn't journey on ayahuasca until so I. I discovered shamanism at age 17. Right. I didn't journey on ayahuasca until I was about 35. Right. Okay. So well, a very big gap. And which is exactly the question that I'm asking you, right? You have all this knowledge about, about what, uh, uh, what could happen, what is going to happen, but then you do do it. Um, were, yeah. you, were you prepared for it? Were you ready? And uh, and how much of it uh, uh, did you take with you afterwards? Did, I mean, you know, what did you remember and, and, and so forth? Well, when I, I want to talk about the event that, that healed me from bulimia before sure. I go into ayahuasca. Okay. Because I think it's very important because I was completely healed from bulimia by a shamanic experience without ayahuasca. Okay. Or anything. And um, so... Well, what Just happened? to go back, yeah, what happened was when I um, finally went to college and I got this mystery scholarship, nobody nobody applied for it, I didn't apply for it, my parents didn't apply for it, I just got a scholarship in the mail, thank God, because I don't know what I would have done. So I go off to college to the University of Arizona, and uh, it was then that I got I got really scared, actually, because I was even worse, worse, worse um, than I'd ever been. And now it was just me. There were no parents to rebel against. There was nobody telling me what I should be doing. There I was, best binging and purging five times a day. This is how I'm going to live my life, I'm thinking. Like, is this me? This is what I'm going to do? I'm, I'm, I'm on my way to the gutter with this. I have no friends. I, I'm shut down sexually. I, I had no sexual experiences. I was like 18, you know, by this time, off to college. I didn't talk to people. I started getting C's in school. I couldn't concentrate anymore. I didn't care anymore. And then I got really scared. So something in me, there was a, there was a defining moment where I was in that darkness and there was a voice inside of me that said, I'm more than that. And it was like my higher self spoke to me. It was me in the future. I tuned in to who I really was. And I tuned into who I saw myself in the future, and I saw myself as a healer. I saw myself as a woman of power, and and I said, then, then I have to, I have to do something. Something has to happen. What is it that has to happen? And um, something got really serious in me at that point, and I actually began to take this force of addiction, where I would just, you know, go and eat and throw up and eat, throw up and eat, throw up. That was my day. And when I had that force come into me, then I would force myself to dance, move my body, get in my body, breathe, or I would force myself to do art. So I, instead of destruction, I pointed the energy to creation. 
And I, I think that was a really defining moment, even for the spirits, because in shamanism, they say that the spirits take compassion on us, and then they, they offer us healing. And so there's this hero's journey of we have to struggle with ourselves, and we have to be the ones that make the decision. Yeah, you, had, you, you have to go on that journey. You, you've got to go to the mountaintop mm-hmm. at some point. Um, I, I, I want to go back for a second, because you said something okay. interesting that caught my ear. You got a mysterious scholarship in the mail. You didn't ap- apply yeah. for it. The, the family didn't apply for it. Nobody knew about no. it, but you accepted it, and that was to Arizona State. Was it in Tempe? It was in University of Arizona in, in Tucson, Tucson. In Tucson. So in Tucson. N- now, so obviously, to me, hearing that, you were meant to go to this university and find yourself, and somebody was guiding you there. I know you've put thought to that. What do you think actually happened? Did you ever find out who sent you the scholarship? <laughs> no, it's, a, it's actually something I'm quite interested in. I really should contact the school and, and figure that out. Like, what happened there? It, it was a woman's achievement scholarship. That's all I know. And you were um, you were chosen to go on this journey. I mean, that that's that's very that's very bizarre. I mean, and it is kind of weird. Yeah, you might not have found yourself <laughs> if it wasn't in Tucson at that moment. If you think about it. So okay, I know that's a defining moment. Yeah, yeah. So um. So now I'm involved with the Foundation for Shamanic Studies a little bit. So I, I had um, another mysterious thing happen. A friend of mine, the, the same friend that introduced me to Jim Morrison and gave me a Jim Morrison tape. And so I'm listening to this Jim Morrison tape over and over. I fall in love with Jim Morrison, of course. And then I'm like, shaman, shamanism, shaman. I have to figure that out. And so the same friend that gave me that tape also sends me a piece of mail. People used to do that back then. And it was a flyer for uh, the basic shamanic journey workshop that was coming to the University of Arizona. Aha. So, aha, there yes. was the other clue. And it was like, of course I'm going. So uh, it, I ride my bike. It was like 18 miles away, actually. And I'm on my bicycle, you know, riding out there. I'm 18 years old. I don't have a car. <laughs> so I'm riding my bike to the basic shamanic journey. And I get there. And it's Sandra Ingerman teaching the workshop. And and I'm messed up. Like, you know, I'm binging five times a day. I'm, I'm a mess, you know. No no superhuman there. Um, so I go to the workshop. And at some point in the workshop, Sandra is standing right in front of me. And she looks into my eyes. And she looked right into my soul. And she, I felt like she saw everything. And she was so present and so encompassing and compassionate, but not going to save me kind of compassionate. She just saw it all. And in that moment, I said, whatever that is, that's what I want to be. Wow. And that little anchor from looking into her eyes carried me for about 10 years. For 10 years, I was on the shamanic path, just healing and working. And, and I had to tell my mom, I had to sit her down one day, and I, I had to say, uh, Mom, I'm, I'm going to quit college because I have to follow my heart. Because if I don't follow my heart, it's going to be really bad. Look at, look at already, right? You know, so um, I knew that I had to follow mysticism. And, and here's why. So let me tell you about the healing, which is really amazing. So, so one night, I just decide I really want to get my my soul back. So now I've done some shamanic journey work. I know the lingo. I know I know about soul loss. So when somebody has traumatic events happen, it's called disassociation in psychology. You know, part of you disassociates from the experience so that you don't have to be really present for it. Right. And so you're kind of not all there. And if you look at pictures of me, you'll see I'm not all there. In my childhood, in my and in high school and things, like there's like I'm half there and I'm half here. And uh, that's just because it was just really, really painful to, for me to be here. It uh, wasn't like an enticing thing for me. So I had one foot in and one foot out. And so now I know this is called soul loss. 
Now I know that there's something called soul retrieval. Now I know that you can ask the spirits for help, and I know how to do that. So one night, here, I'll, t- I'll tell you, this. okay, this, is, this will be great for all the potheads out there because I don't smoke pot, but I've smoked pot, I think, three times in my life. And on this particular night, because it alters me so strongly, I, I can't really do it. Um, it's not really fun for me. I'm, I'm, I'm so with people, I'm, I'm with you. Okay. <laughs> some people get artistic and yeah. they're really creative, and I get like uh, I can't talk to people. I got I feel like really weird. It's it's not my thing, but I know that it alters me so much that I, I'm like, okay, I'm gonna take one hit of pot, and then I'm gonna meditate, and I'm gonna I'm gonna ask for my soul to come back. So, I did. So I sit there, take a toke, and then I sit in meditation position. And I just put out that call, like, okay, I, I want to heal this, I want to heal this, I want to heal this. So I lay back, and I, I doze into the, I don't know, the fourth dimension. I go into another dimension. In this other dimension, there's a scene going on. And in the scene, there's a circle of people sitting down, and I'm in the circle. And my mother is there. And my mother begins to get really angry. This is something she used to do. Um, if she's listening, she knows She knows that she used to get really angry. So she was getting really angry and doing stuff and starting to talk to me. And I just cut it off and I said, I want my power back. I want my power back. I want my power back. And orgasmically, my soul came back into my body in three, like, <gasps> like that. Wow. Inhaling my soul back into my body. Obvious. Um, like, like being baptized. Yeah, I was just gonna say, was it a like a a, a Christian see the light moment, right? <laughs> was it? Was well, it... I've had one of those, but it's this particular experience was not that one. I I have had an experience with the the Christ light being reborn, let's say, through the Christ light. Then I finally understood what everybody was talking about there. Um. But this particular experience was very, very much physical. It was my body. It was something coming home to me. It was me coming back. What was it like at, at the very next day? You go to sleep and you wake up. New person? No, it, more of a gradual change. So it took about a month or six weeks for the bulimia to stop. So it wasn't like, bing! I'm done, you know? Right. Um, I haven't found any of my transitions to be like that. All of my transitions have a little bit of that transition. You know, when you, like, work on iMovie and you stick that little transition thing in there? Right. Um, in a cut? It's like that. <laughs> right, not... right, right. That's that's a really good <laughs> yeah. way to put it. Um, and let me yeah. ask you, now, let me ask you this. This is, a, you know, a little more personal, but before... This evening, uh, uh, when you took the toke, you know, before this evening, uh, in your life prior to that, what was your humor like? Were you did did you find it hard to laugh and to smile and to find humor in things? You know, and then and then after that, w- were you now smiling more and and you know, opening up a bit more to to that side of consciousness? Was there a a before and after moment? Well, it's interesting you say that. I mean, you, there's not a lot of pictures of me smiling. <laughs> right, right, right. I was a very serious child, you know. I mean, there's a lot of pictures of me with my eyes wide open, like like a seer or something. You're like, whoa, what is she looking at, you know? Um, this, like, stunned look. Um, and, the, you know, healing is a complex of gifts, I believe, that we get uh, many boons. So... Then I also met my first boyfriend, which was a really big part of it all because it diverted my attention to something else. It was the first time that I ever had somebody by my side that uh, was helping to direct the experience. Let's go to the sweat lodge, let's play guitar, let's do this, let's do that. And that was a key part. So that, I believe, was also gifted to me at the same exact time. And... Um, and that was so I do think that I probably did begin to laugh more, but I, be, I began to open up to a relationship I had never 
right. had a relationship. I right. didn't even really have friendships. Right, right, right. And uh, I want to continue on the journey here. Um, but uh, the 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 change that happens also now you have direction. You have goals now. You know where you need to go. You have... Uh, mm -hmm. you, you have a map now in front of you that you didn't have prior, or maybe it didn't make sense to you if you knew about it prior. But now, like you said, you have one foot in, one foot out, but you kind of know, you know, you're nudging yourself now to goals. Is that, is that now your objective? Well, I've dedicated my life to shamanism when that healing happened. Right. That's when I, um, shortly after that, let's see. Had I already quit, I don't believe I'd already quit. So that, that changed a lot for me because when even when I was in school, so I got this scholarship, this Women's Achievement Scholarship, but I didn't want to be anything that was on the menu. I look at the menu and I'm like, okay, doctor, veterinarian, lawyer, like, you know, it was just so dry to me. And I wanted to study mysticism. Like, I wanted to be a mystic. So, so I'm looking and I, so I take East Asian Buddhism and I take Indian mysticism and poetry and I just try to put together this mystic program, you know, college experience. <laughs> yeah, which they, I think they have now in some places, but nobody had that then. And then I just realized at some point, I said, look, you know, it, it's a life or death situation for me. I mean, this is not, I can't pussyfoot around with this stuff. I can't afford to do something I don't want to do. Plus, I'm so passionate about shamanism. That's all I wanted to be was a healer. Uh, so I dedicated my life. I quit school. I apprenticed a woman healer. I trained all women's foundation for shamanic studies. I went through a three and a half year intensive program with the foundation and I did shamanic journeys all the time. I began a practice. I started taking on clients and I moved out to the country. I was like, I don't want to have anything to do with cities. And I didn't live in a city for 10 years. I lived out in the country with the, the trees and the plants and things. How was your mom? Um, I, how was your mom through this part? Was you know, fully supportive or was she questioning things? And of course, you know, all parents want their kids to, you know, finish school and that didn't happen. You know, so how was the family? I know. <laughs> well, okay. My mom always, she always, that I'll pay for your school if you want to finish school. And, you know, honey, do you want to finish school? But she was always really sweet, actually. She, she's been incredibly supportive. I've been a difficult child to have because there were times where I, if I didn't call them for two weeks, they didn't know if I would end up in Guatemala. Right. Uh, and I'd be giving them a telephone call from Guatemala or some other state. And so I was like that. I mean, I went in my, my van and I traveled across country by myself. And I wasn't really telling them what I was doing, so I probably made her worry a lot. But she's always been very supportive, actually. Um, she's never told me that I should do anything else. And I think they've been a little worried about me because I blazed my own trail, and it wasn't. It, this has not been a road that's been traveled much. And I couldn't work inside of a building in a chair with fluorescent lights. And I tried working for other people a couple times, and it never worked out. So I've always had to make my own way. And my dad, too, who just passed away um, about six weeks ago, he also never said anything. And he was Mr. Conservative. And I know that he always wanted me to, you know, finish college and then go live on a winery and have a family and he just wanted to see me have that life and it's just it just wasn't the way that I was made if you know and really listening to my heart there's nothing else I could really do but just follow it because I knew the consequences of not following it oh we need and I wasn't willing I, I want to go back and wrap up uh, the end of uh, the bulimia because you said that that lasted for about a month. Um, did it, mm -hmm. did it slow down, you know, did it slow down or was it just an abrupt, you woke up one day and, and you stopped, uh, ejecting your food? <laughs> it slowed down. It, so in that, that month time period, also what was moving in was this 
new boy, boyfriend, so he was moving into my field and into my space. So that, that um, and he was a strong personality, and that was really good for me because I, I almost just kind of gave over some of the direction to him. Um, so he was moving in, and then I also started, it was also at the same point where I started dancing and singing and painting. And so I was adding more stuff. I was adding things that were keeping my time and my attention on creative stuff a little more than the destructive stuff. And then by the time I moved in with my boyfriend, I then I was only doing it like I did it a couple times. Um, and that, that was really it. And then it was just gone. How did you, how did you change physically? And also, oh, I meant to ask, uh, what were you eating? What was your diet? Well, the interesting thing was, like, all the foods that were off limits are the ones that I would binge on, but those are not the ones that I would actually digest. <laughs> right. Uh, so I would, if I would digest food, if I actually, <laughs> it's really crazy. I mean, the life of a bulimic is crazy. So I, I've i always had a, a, a food thing, let's say, and um, I like clean, organic food. But I had also created this, these things are bad for me and I can't have them situation. And then, so I would binge on all of those. I would binge on ice cream and donuts and chocolate and everything that I wasn't supposed to have. And then in order not to have to deal with the ramifications of digesting it, I would throw it up. And then if there, and then I would throw it all up and then I would give myself something clean and easily digestible. I would take herbs. I would do healing on myself. Kind of crazy, right? So this sounds really crazy. But anyone that's ever been an addict of anything will understand. Right. <laughs> um, it's craziness. And then after, this is, uh, I, and so then after the bulimia was over, you know, and I'm, I'm not being cavalier here. I'm not trying to be funny. But now were you free to just run around and just get crazy on all kinds of food that that, that maybe you shouldn't have been eating uh, or couldn't or didn't want to before, but now phew, now you can do what you want? Was it like no. that? No. You no. behaved? The interesting. Mm -mm. You behaved. Yeah, it's more like, um, it's more of a preference now. Ah. It's just. It's, I prefer this energy to that energy. So it it wasn't a control. It, it didn't need my control anymore. Very interesting. We, we got to take a break right here. And when we come back, we're going to continue the journey with uh, Beth okay. Leon. And obviously, we got to talk some martial arts, too. I got to get into I this. Know. Yeah, we're, gonna, <laughs> we're definitely going to go there. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Beth Leon. Stay right there. More with Beth after this short break. Way out here, we listen to Jimmy Church. You're listening to Fade to Black. Always on the edge of the hottest alternative talk, Jimmy Church with Fade to Black. KGRARadio.com. ¿Qué tal, mis amigos? Yo soy Mario Carzanel, tiburón, y los invito para que escuchen a mi buen amigo Jimmy Church Radio. Claro que sí. Do you know what's in your body soap? Well, I didn't know the answer until about five years ago when I looked at the label of my soap and was shocked to see all the chemicals. For my entire life, I had been assaulting the largest organ of my body, my skin, and to think my children were using it too. Well, a lot has changed since then. Today, my family and I operate Stone City Farms, where we make and sell all natural goat milk soap using fresh goat milk from goats we raise on our farm. Our mission at Stone City Farm is to produce high quality, all natural goat milk soap for people who want a fresh, unrefined natural product. At Stone City Farms, we offer scented and unscented soaps and a signature line of gift sets customizable to your needs. To see what our customers are saying, go to StoneCityFarm.com. Use the code NATURAL for a 20% discount. That's StoneCityFarm.com. Code NATURAL for 20% off your order. You never know what could be hiding in your soap. 
Did you ever turn to your radio for your favorite talk show to find that it's been preempted for this? In the air, a deep right center. That goes Lewis to the wall, and it's all here! Or this? And I'm ashamed of you, Hillary, for voting for it. Do you have a favorite talk radio program that's not available in your city? Just go to TalkStreamLive.com for links to the best streaming talk radio shows. At TalkStream Live, you will find live talk shows 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All your favorites are here. With such a large selection, you will also discover some new favorites. On the go and still want to listen? With the mobile smartphone, simply type TalkStream Live on your internet browser. Now you can take internet radio with with you. You will also find hundreds of music, news, and sports streams. Best of all, the TalkStream Live directory is free and there's never a login required. Remember TalkStreamLive.com, the fastest route between you and your favorite talk radio show. You are listening to Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Network. Oi, oi, I'm Reese Evans. You're listening to Jimmy Church. This is Revolution. The Revolution will not be televised. The Revolution is on radio. Ciao. Back to Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Beth Leone. We're taking a journey tonight. It's been an amazing conversation. I'm watching Twitter and everything else. It's going to continue right now. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Email is jimmy at jimmychurchradio.com. Follow us on Twitter at jchurchradio. And Beth's Twitter is at zenwell, Z-E-N-W-E-L-L. Now, Beth... <clears throat> I'm yes. six. I'm six foot. I'm two hundred pounds, right? And That's good. I, I'm six foot, two hundred pounds. But when, um, with your martial arts background, look, you are you're in shape. You're good looking. You uh, take care of yourself. The last thing when somebody sees you is probably <laughs> thinking that kind of thought with that kind of training. So I'm just going to ask you right now, I don't know you walking down the street, guy like me, six foot, 200 pounds and, and shouts and, you know, does that stupid male, you know, gorilla thing and says something stupid. Uh, Could you drop me? Could you just turn around and just drop me? Put me in my place. Thank you. What's that? I would say thank you. First. See, that's because you can. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Okay. You'd say thank you before dropping me. Okay. All right. No, I would just say thank you. I, I, you know, you got to pick your battles. See, <laughs> this is what I tell people. Um, for, I tell people that I'm not trained to fight. I'm just trained to kill because a woman is never going to find herself in a fisticuff match with a man. So if a woman ever, ever needs to pull a punch, it's because her life is in serious danger. And in that case, there's only a couple things to do. <laughs> oh, and man. yeah. Yeah, you say that That's- with such confidence and it just, uh, it freaks me out. My my little brother, Danny, is a, is a martial arts uh, uh, um, award-winning, just crazy, crazy guy. I mean, really... Uh, Self control, and he speaks a lot like you do, right? But it's really funny. Mm-hmm. I used to change his diapers, right? And uh, uh-huh. and and I'm a foot. No, I'm six inches taller than he is. You know, I'm a bigger guy, and he scares the crap out of me now because I just. And he's such a cool guy. Yeah. He's so nice. He's so funny. But I just know if the line was ever crossed, I lose. You know, that's all there is to it. So now I'm a lot well, more. I, res- I do feel extremely mm-hmm. confident. I mean. If I walk down an alley, and for one, and I, I like to teach women what you know certain things to do. Here's a really great thing for all you women out there: get the get a key 
uh, key ring that has a long, you know, you have those ones, they have that little, the long, I don't even know what it is, thing on them. What are those called? The um, material at the end of the key ring that's long. I do not a know tag, what it's called. A but tag, anyway, a tag. Kind of. It's like uh, like a loop almost. Like you can put it around your head if you wanted to. You could put your keys around your head. It's like keys on a necklace. Okay. You, you know? Yeah. So they sell these things, whatever those are. I have those. And you put your keys at the end of them. And you can actually flip it around in, on your finger is what you do. Right. It's a fun thing to do. You, you flip it around on your finger. So if you're walking down a road late at night, you walk in the middle of the road. You don't walk on the side of the road. You walk in the middle because then you've got a good 10, 15 feet of bu- buffer around you. You can see something coming. And then you just spin your keys around. Like anyone that gets close to me gets to get these keys right in their eyes. You know? Ah. And that's, yeah, that's how you walk down the street late at night as a woman. <laughs> Everybody's writing writing that down right now. Yeah, okay, lanyard. You get your, you get, the lanyard. There yes. you go. Thank you. Yes. Yes, a lanyard. And, um, you, you know, you stand up nice and tall. You get a 360-degree view around you. We call it holding the perimeter. You become aware of everything around you. You know where everyone is. And you've got a good buffer, so you can always, you know, just get out of the way. That's the best thing. And then you walk and you spin your keys, and you're not prey at that point. So Nobody's going to look at you as prey. Right, right. And how, okay, let's talk about this this journey through martial arts. How, how did that happen? Uh, uh, it, it, let's start there. Well, that was also something that kind of came from this bulimia thing, because I had so I had become a, a track machine, and the whole track thing kind of almost got me into this too because I started controlling my diet to become a better runner, and then suddenly all these foods are off limits and I can't eat them anymore, and so I get this this really strong desire for them, and so I eat them. I went through a little while of just kind of eating the foods that weren't on my list and then dealing with it, and then I realized I could throw them up. So there's this complex that happened from being a national track runner and from really gaining my identity um, from that. And I, I, wa- I, ra- I can't say that tonight. I won a lot. Um, and so I, I was getting praise. And at a certain point in time, I hated running. But I did it just to get praise. And so, and I was bulimic and I really needed to stop and I really needed to do other things but I was stuck in this achievement um, thing and getting other people's approval. It was the only, only thing, the only way I got attention. So I vowed that I would never work out again until I wanted to, number one. And then when it came time for me, like when I had, you know, that, that whole thing in the past, and it's like, okay, I want to get into my body again because I always had a ton of energy and I loved to be in my body. And so then I put out this this thought to the universe and I said, I want to do something that has a spiritual root to it and something that will heal my body rather than break it down because I was completely bored with running and lifting weights and I just felt it was going to break my body down. And I didn't know what it was. I really didn't even know about the martial arts. So I started contemplating and I started thinking yoga, martial arts, yoga, martial arts. And I had so much energy that um, synchronistically, synchronistically, I began training with a school of shamanic medicine. I'm in Phoenix now at this time, and I get hooked up with this school of shamanic medicine that also has a martial arts component to it. And so I began training in the martial arts in my shamanic school of medicine. This is perfect for me. (laughs) It's like, great. And then, and also, that school of shamanic medicine had a sacred sexual wing to it, where they started. They were teaching the sacred sexual teaching. So, this is like the perfect find for me, um, needing to up level my game, because I was really broken. I was broken, broken from like the start, and 
so to find myself in a place where there was lineage information on, on martial arts, on shamanism, and on sexuality all, all in one place was like hog heaven for me. Mm-hmm. And so um, the martial arts began there. And it began because I wanted, I, I wanted something that I, uh, I could meditate, it was a spiritual practice, and that it would also heal my body. Was it and the na- martial arts has that in it. Yeah, exactly. Mm-hmm. Was it natural for you? Yes. Yes, it was very natural for me. If I have past lives, I definitely have past lives as a as a male warrior, that's for sure. <laughs> and how long, now that you have uh, five black belts now, how long uh, did that process take? I mean, that's not easy. It's very physical. And it's uh, it takes time. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't do that in a month. How long did that take to achieve? No, that is earned. Um, so black belts are earned. That took me 12 years to achieve that. And so the the belt system in the States is different than the belt system in China or Japan. So the old school is, you know, you wouldn't get a black belt for 10 years. And you would have to mop the floors of your master and you would eat rice and you would sleep on a tatami mat on a stone floor for those 10 years. And that's how you get a black belt. So what happened was when the martial arts came to the West, people were like, uh, I don't think so. I don't want to do that. Nobody would get a black belt if that's how it was here. And so essentially the Taekwondo organization created the Western black belt system, which is you can get a black belt in about two years. And so that's, that's pretty much what it is. So in the school, so I ended up having five martial arts schools, training thousands of people. So I, it just became my life for, for a decade. And inside of that system, our, our particular system, it takes two years to get a black belt. If you train, you come to the school and you train three to five days a week. Or if you were to train with a master instructor a lot, consistently because a master you you get even more because you don't have to you'll get information from a master instructor in the kitchen one hour in the kitchen that might take you a month to get in the dojo so you can do it in a year on, in that way anyway i was married to a master this is one of the like ways that i got like dharmically you know drawn into all of this and i trained for 12 years so that's I got five black belts from that. And how with uh, shamanism and enlightenment and consciousness also going on at the same time, did you find a way to completely mesh the two? Because obviously your brain and, and consciousness and, and how you're moving forward, these two lives need to mesh. And And did you blend them together? Well, I just continued my personal practice. So I would always have women clients that were apprenticing with me that I was teaching how to do sacred ceremony and how to call in the powers and how to do the shamanic journey and all these things. So I would always have women that I was working with and then I would have workshops. I carried on my shamanic life, which wasn't really, it, it wasn't really, it wasn't harmonious with our martial arts schools. Our martial arts schools were paramilitary It was a paramilitary martial art organization, which I'm very thankful for because I have a particular education now that I would have never gotten and an understanding of many things that you only get in that kind of a situation. But it had nothing to do with shamanism and spirituality. So I still had my closet hidden practice on the side. Do you still practice Um, martial arts uh, today, every day? I do practice. I don't practice every day. I have committed like the last two years of my life to getting my programs online, which has actually been quite a sacrifice for me on many levels. But now that it's there, I feel like I'm able to go back into my practice. And I I used to have to practice every day. And then I had uh, spiritual consultants tell me, they were like, look, you've got to break that because that's like like you feel like you have to, you know. And I I have broken that, but I, I need to get back. So actually what I do a lot of times is I have created my own thing because it's more than the martial arts now. I mean, really, my greatest love is Qigong. We haven't even talked about Qigong. Right. Because Qigong is, is the root of all martial arts. And Qigong 
is mystic. And Qigong has a lot of information and references to the stars and the Pleiades and uh, star beings. And essentially, it, the, in the history books, they say that it came from the star beings. So when you get into Qigong, it's in a whole other world. Now, Qigong merges together shamanism. And so for me, um, in my Qigong practice, I am communing with the energy of the earth and communing with the energy of the cosmos and communing with the trees and breathing in all the energy. So it's a much more intimate shamanic experience while at the same time you're building your body up, you're healing your body. So it incorporates my like, my love for healing. Um, <clears throat> you're healing the body, you're building your muscles up. So that incorporates my love for like working out and having strong muscles and and they, then, then there's a sexual component. So if you study Qigong long enough, you will be initiated into the sexual Qigong. Well, and, and, and the, we're, we're going to get into that, and we need to definitely uh, talk about uh, light beings and, and what is going on right now. And all of this is coming together for me. But you mentioned earlier <laughs> the hero's journey. And and if you look at the hero's journey and certainly Joseph Campbell's uh, definition of it, you are definitely on the hero's journey, right? Your textbook definition of hero's journey. It's um, textbook. Yeah, to- wounded healer. Yeah, totally, yeah. totally. And so, but the element of bliss uh, has to come into the picture here. At this yeah. point, <laughs> and, uh, uh, have you found? Uh, at this point, had you found your bliss? Or have you found your bliss? I think I'm on my bliss more now than ever. Um, I I do I do bliss out under hard training conditions. I definitely bliss out. Um, the change of consciousness that occurs when I'm training hard in the martial arts or in qigong is just lovely. Mm-hmm. And so I was blissing out on that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm blissing out in a different way now, but I still have, I, it, this is, this journey just keeps going and going. It's, it's never ending. Um, I'm still on my journey and I'm still, I'm still opening up to more bliss. With the, even more so. I haven't even told you about the other stuff. Yeah. And we're going to, we're, we're, we're going <laughs> to try to get there. And I, you know, what's, what's great about a show like this where we do two and a half hours and, uh, uh, when the conversation is correct, we run out of time. Okay, so yes. uh, I'm hoping that we're going to run out of time tonight. I, I don't see that as being a problem. But with with Qigong um, and light beings and and Pallades and and everything else that starts to come into the picture here, were b- before that had you any reference or anything about? that side of life and that that other dimension that is possible out there uh, had uh, before she gone you know were you there did you have any idea about what that was about to introduce you to hmm. there's some idea that i've had since childhood because i was interacting with the spirit world already uh, but they were like, they weren't the kind of interactions I really wanted because there were a lot of like dead people, you know? Um, and so it was just kind of like whoever I think was wandering about at the time. But I had had um, a few interactions with some higher level beings and the, there were more bliss states. And so inside of shamanism, I started to feel bliss states with connections. And I can't, I can't say I mean, I'll tell you what, I mean, the, the shamanic work um, then with the ayahuasca opened it up to a whole other realm of, of connection with my spirit guides and my angelic beings. Um, that really was the kicker there. And, and now I have this really beautiful connection and I've been given these angel songs to sing um, that are really beautiful, um, that are like wake up calls for people when they're ready to connect to the angelic realm. And so it's just like unfolding like a fine line, I think. Well, and, and you know, science today, um, and when somebody says quantum this or string theory that, I almost disconnect a little bit because 
those tend to be uh, trendy words to say, right, or, or to sound intelligent. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. uh, physics and science today are starting to admit and agree that there is other dimensions out there and that there is the possibility of things going infinitely to the left and to the right. But this is something that we've already known, right? This mm -hmm. is, is something that has been taught throughout millennia and in all different mm -hmm. cultures. And now... Yeah, experientially. Yes, totally, Not totally. Not in the head. Right. Mm -hmm. and, and, and now you're being exposed to that. What do you say to science uh, or out there, the people that that want to say that this is not real, that we live in a bubble, <laughs> that that we're on this treadmill and that's our reality, that there's nothing else out there for us to experience? Well, for me, everything's just experiential. My belief system is based on the experiences that I have had. And I have had particular experiences, and those experiences have shown me a world that is multidimensional. And it's shown me a world where there are spirits and where there are angels it's only because I've had experiences with them. So it's the same thing. Like, um, you know, do you believe in UFOs? Well, if nobody's ever seen a UFO before I had seen a UFO, I would have said, well, I don't know if I see one, I'll believe in it. And so I think it's the same way with science. I think it's fine if people don't believe anything. It's their life. And it's their experience. And it's good to believe what you experienced and to wait, because otherwise you're just a believer. So we're all at different places in our life. We all have different dharmas. And I think we're all really essentially going to the same place. And it's just a different process for each of us. You, to get there. So science is beautiful. You've, uh, you just mentioned UFOs. Have you, besides what you just saw at a, a contact in the desert, which was definitely profound for all of us, have you had an experience before contact? I have. I've had three experiences. And the first one was, I tell you what, if the experience that I had when I first saw UFOs happened at contact in the desert... I mean, people would be like cheering and the whole town would be on fire. And I mean, my first UFO experience was staggering. What happened? And so I'm 21 years old. My boyfriend and I at the time are driving from Reno, Nevada, across the country. And it's late at night. It's probably one o'clock. And so... Outside of Reno, it's kind of like nothing, you know? <laughs> yeah, it is. So you're driving, you know. We get to a point, there's really nothing going on. There's a few cars. And we we rise up over this hill. As we're coming up to the, to the crest of this hill, I see these incinerators, three incinerators, like, you know, when they burn oil and there's the flame on top and everything. And there are these three tall incinerators. And as we rise up to the hill, they just go out. No smoke, no puttering out. They just go out. And I say to myself, incinerator fires don't just go out. Like right. They burn, they burn 24 hours a day, it seems. Yeah. They, they never Yeah. Stop. And if they go out, they kind of putter out or something or there's some smoke. But no, they just like dimmed out like a light and they were gone. And they were, I say incinerator fires because they were triangular and they were that reddish glowing color and they were big. Right, right. So I'm just contemplating that as we continue to drive. And I'm looking out at the skies. I'm saying, that's really weird that incinerator fires go out. So I'm looking. And off in the sky to the right is about seven of them. And they're, they're white. They're bright. They're white. They look circular, a spherical circular. And they're doing maneuvers. So there, a couple of them are kind of hovering, and then there's one over but to the left, let's say, and then it goes, and it goes really, really fast well, how over to go? the right. And it, do, do that again. How'd it go? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like that. Right. You know what I mean. I do. Now, now I do. Yeah. Yes. 
And so I'm like, whoa, okay. And then it turns a corner, right, really fast. And then it's going across the sky. And what does it do? But it pops out like three lights out of it, like, like baby light eggs. They come straight down. They pop out these three lights straight down on this perfect, beautiful light pattern. And they do that a few times. And then they go to the end and then they go to the other. So they're doing this maneuver. Wow. This thing. Wow. Uh, I've never seen anything like it before or since. What'd your boyfriend say? He saw it too, right? He saw everything he was driving. Yeah, he saw it too. He saw it too. We were in awe. We didn't say anything. We stopped the van. We got out and we just looked. And we were like, oh, my God. How beautiful. Whoa. Oh, my God. Look at that. They just popped some lights out. Woo. Um, and so I, I actually re- remember writing Sandra Ingerman because this was at the time and I was just like, my whole life was, I was just, I was just getting turned on to all of it. Like I was, you know, my soul had just come back. I was having, you know, spiritual shamanic experiences. Now I'm seeing UFOs, you know? <laughs> so I remember writing a letter and telling Sandra, okay, but wait, that's not all. So they do this for a while. They do this maneuver for a little bit. It's completely soundless. There's no sound. And, uh, I just was thinking, I don't think we can make anything like that. Like, I'm not sure we have that technology because um, it, go, it, go, it just goes really fast and then the, the G-forces of turning so quickly. How, how big were they? Pin. Yeah, how big were they, Beth? Do you remember? Yeah, these ones, um, so if you're looking out at the sky, I mean, gosh, it's really hard to describe that kind of perspective, but they uh, they weren't huge. They were white, kind of glowing, spherical things, and they would have been like the size of a nickel. Oh wow! If I, you know, if, if I'm looking out at the sky, right, and right. I see, and I put, a, if I hold a nickel out in front of me, or a dime, if I held a dime out in front of me with my arm outstretched like this, like they might be that big, I guess. Wow! Not that big, I don't think. Any? Uh, did you guys have any oh. missing time? And not that we know of, we, we weren't looking at the time. Right. But right. here's the interesting thing. What was interesting, not one car drove by during the whole time that we were watching this. And we were out there for probably 30 minutes. Oh, no kidding. Standing on, and this is a highway. Right. From Reno to bum, that's whatever. Right. You know? Right, right, right. Out in the middle of the desert. But wait, that's not all. Okay, so no one's driving on that road either. It's completely silent now. And we did talk about it. We're like, how come there were no cars? So at a certain point, these like seven craft that are off into the sky on the right, they all just go, and they're gone. They're out of here. That's it. Wow. And I'm just sitting there like, oh, my God. Did you see that? Did we just see that? And you wrote Sandra, right? Oh, okay, we've got about uh, 30 seconds here, and then we'll take okay, a I break. Have to tell you, there's a convergence of them over on the desert in the left. I turn my head around, and then I hear, wow, 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 wow. And I, I walk 10 feet, and the energy field was too much. I couldn't go any further, and they were still a mile out in the desert. There was a convergence of these triangular objects out there. There was like 25 of them. That's incredible. And you see, this is what's funny. We're going to hit a break right here. But this is what's funny about that when you have something so profound and you touched upon it. You know, is it us? Is that our technology? Or is it E.T.? And to me, okay. if it's E.T., I'm a little bit better off with that thought. Because if it's us and, and that's our technology and you and I don't know about it and they're holding that technology back and we're still burning, you know, we're still burning gas mm-hmm. in cars. Uh, that's, I think that's uh, a, a, an even bigger story. Our guest tonight, <laughs> Beth Leon. I'm going to find out about what she said to Sandra right after the break. Stay right there. Hi, everybody. This is Rob Halford, the Metal God, on JimmyChurchRadio.com. KGRA Radio Intelligent Talk 
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. If your home has hard water and it's leaving white spots, then it's likely that Limescale is clogging your pipes. Limescale can cost hundreds of dollars a year in wasted energy and early appliance breakdown. HydroCare systems available at Wave Home Solutions prevent and remove Limescale with just a simple filter change every three years. There are no salts, chemicals, or magnetic coils. Satisfaction guaranteed. For more information, just go to bestwater123.com. That's bestwater123.com. Hi, I'm Richard Dolan. When I'm not hosting my radio program, The Richard Dolan Show on KGRA, or writing new books on UFOs, I run a publishing company. I'm proud to say that Richard Dolan Press has published some of the most fascinating books available on UFOs and related subjects. They include Dr. Bruce Maccabee's classic analysis of the UFO cover-up, David Marler's breakthrough book on triangular UFOs, Dr. Richard Souter's unique work on underground bases, and other classics by Grant Cameron, Chase Kletsky, and Dr. Bob Wood. Not to mention intriguing works by Eve Lorgan and Laurie McDonald that deal with truly bizarre phenomena. I'm proud to publish such high quality and original works, and there are several amazing books about to be released over the next few months. Go to richarddolanpress.com to learn more. Did you know that when you're on the road with limited data or Wi-Fi available, you can still listen to every minute of Fade to Black by just calling 605-562-4482. No smartphone, app, or internet needed. It saves your data plan and no extra cost if you have unlimited minutes. Just call 605-562-4482. You can listen to me, Jimmy Church, on any phone, anytime, anywhere. Go back, Lee Tappy. You want to know a secret? I love ponies. I really love ponies. I'm serious. I couldn't stay sane without ponies to brush. Why fade to black? Because you never got that pony. Damn it. This is Fade to Black with Jimmy Church on the Game Changer Radio Network and KGRA, the Global Radio Alliance. Welcome back to Fade to Black. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Bespoke Radio. That's what this is. Uh, the Game Changer Network and KGRA The Planet. Our guest tonight, Beth Leone. <laughs> Tomorrow night is Fader Night. John Rappaport will be here with his No More Fake Newsroom. And then Friday, I'm over uh, hosting Coast to Coast with Larry Flaxman and Open Lines. It's Friday night over a coast. So that's the week here. It's been a great week, too, and an amazing conversation tonight. And you know what's funny, Beth, is is every night I go, man, this is the greatest show ever. You know, how do I top tonight? Well, and that's where I'm at tonight. It's been a it's really, really great conversation. I want to get I want to get back to this uh, UFO thing. What was it that you said to Sandra? And, and certainly she's somebody that is going to respond in an interesting way, too, as well. So what did you say? How did you how did you share this experience? Well, I remember uh, getting it to my destination. Then I wrote her a letter. I just, because I, she, she's the, at that time, she was the, like my spiritual mother in a way, or she's the person that affected me like that and really was um, anchoring how I wanted to be in the world. And so I wrote her a letter and I shared with her what I saw. And Sandra is a woman of few words when you write her letters and writing back, she's at that time, I think she was already pretty popular. And so I think she may have written me back just something really sweet, you know, a couple lines or something. Um, but she's really a master at just being very succinct and, um, not getting too involved in the conversation, but 
um, keeping the power, you know, really good at keeping the power. Um, yeah. And so, yeah, I do want to talk about like how this has, how this all has gone into what, what I'm teaching now, because this whole big story of my illness and then martial arts and then shamanism and then Qigong, it's all gotten distilled into this offering that I give into the world, which is, like I say, like I, I help people to activate their badass superpowers because really, after all of this, the one thing that I see is that we live on a beautiful planet with the most amazing creatures, the most amazing waters, waterfalls and forests and jungles and beauty. And if it's left alone or tended properly, that beauty flourishes and so do we. And we've gotten a little out of hand. And that out-of-handedness is causing destruction, just like when I was being bulimic. I was just being destructive. And there was sort of a certain point in time that I started to turn that wheel around, and I wanted to be creative, and I wanted to make something of myself, and I wanted to make something of my life and make it count. And what that has alchemized into is a stance of, this is serious. Like, I don't want, I just don't want my life to just flitter away with no effect. All of these things that I learned in my healing, the shamanism and then the martial arts and the qigong and the, the sexuality and the relationships, to me, all, all combined into a life of power and what, a life of effect. What's the, first, what's, the fir, what's the first step? I mean, when somebody comes to you and, and they feel that they're ready for change or that they know that the earth is in flux right now and, and, and most of it is our fault first off and the change of consciousness needs to happen on a global level and they come to you. What's the first step for them? The first thing that I do with people when they come to me is I do what I call a soul session. It's a really deep listening and uncovering process of who they are. What is up? What is their medicine? in the world, what's their holy path, or their sacred cause, and what, where are they in that journey? Like, where are they in their hero's journey in view of who are they as a soul and what have they come here to do? And that is the meta vision. Like, that's what I need to see first. So, so I use my ability to open up into the seeing part to listen to that and then from there, there will be a very clear directive of what needs to happen for their next step in their journey. And it's different for everybody. What, what I you... have developed. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. No, go ahead. You've developed. Uh, well, I have developed specific programs for people to go through. Like, for instance, I have a program called The Art of Love for Men. It's my flagship program that shares with men these lineage secrets about sacred relationship and sacred sexuality, and it initiates them into the mysteries of the female body from lineage secrets so that men get the, the information they deserve to have, the education that nobody's giving us, that we can get, but it's really hard. You have to, like, you have to dig to get this kind of stuff. So I created that um, to support men in being conscious alphas and really standing up, and part of it is in having these beautiful relationships with the feminine, with a woman. Because as you know, you've got Rita. Right. And she's got to be a big part of your strength. Uh, yeah, 100%. 105. Right? 105. What would it be like if you didn't have her by your side? Oh, I wouldn't be on the microphone right now, that's for sure. I'd probably be uh, starving in the streets somewhere, lonely, <laughs> directionless. <laughs> Begging for change. Well, that's how she found. Rita, are you liking this? <laughs> that's how she found me. You know, she cleared the crap out of my eyes, gave me a breath mint, and sent me back to school. And uh, here we are today. You know, but yeah, it's yeah. It's, it's 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 really true. Um, let me ask that's you this: the, the power. I want to I want to get I want to get back to your teachings for a second, but uh, and 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 how you help people. But there's also there's a very um, 
palatable thing that is going on right now on Earth. I mean, there's there's a definite darkness out there, and I think we can all feel it and see it, and mm-hmm. and and we're directionless, and we know that uh, we're we're definitely uh, on the backside of going down the wrong road as humanity in general. And and do you see and feel the same thing that I'm referring to? I mean, it w- we've never been in a stranger place on this planet than we are today. I do. I, I, I see exactly what you see and feel. Like when I was three years old and my first thought is, what have they done? I still think that. And it's what are they doing? And that they is us. Right. Humanity as a whole. And so a big part of my life is what can we do? What, what can we do to anchor in the reality we want to have? And it starts with us. It starts with the individual in creating the, how am I going to be in the world? Who am I going to be in the world? What do I stand for? What's your take on what the inner child? What's your take on the inner child? Oh, the inner child is where all the magic is. <laughs> well, you, you can't you can't let me off that easy. <laughs> <laughs> we are all children, and I think the inner child has a lot. I've been I've been working on reclaiming. Just I'm working on letting my inner child run the show more. Actually, I'm looking at her right now. Actually, because the last talk that I did on stage. When I brought up the photo of me as a child, which I'm looking at right now, the guy, one of the guys said, your whole aura changed and you became so soft and the way that you were talking completely changed. And so he told me, he said, the next time you give a talk or go on stage, make sure that you look at that picture of you as a little girl. And so I have it right here on my computer because she's so innocent and she's so beautiful and that's me. You know what? You know what frustrates me is when, uh, and especially when I was a kid, when I would look at adults. Now today I'm 52. Okay, I'm 52, and when I was a kid, 52 was my grandfather. Right, that was just an old, yeah. an old cranky dude. Right. And yeah, and I never wanted to grow up. I didn't want to turn into my teachers and the principal of the school or whatever, you know, adults that were acting like adults. I, I didn't mm-hmm. want to go there. And today here I am at 52 and I, and I have the same mentality and I just won't let go of the way I felt when I was 15, 14, you know, 10, 20 mm-hmm. years old. And, and I just don't want to let go of that. And I look around at friends of mine that are the same age today that are turning into adults. And I think that sucks. I really do. I mean, why let go of, of questioning, of wonder, of walking down the road and wondering why that plant is growing or that, you know, that dog or that cat or the life around you where you questioned everything, you know, you don't have all the answers. Don't grow up to be an adult with all of the answers. You know, yeah. am I wrong yeah. with that point of view? I think you're right on. I think they say something about that in the Bible, too. Something about, you know, a child entering into the kingdom of heaven. or Yeah, like a child. And I really feel that our, our magic child, that really is where the magic is, the innocence is. Most people already knew what they wanted to do when they were a little child. They, are, they already had their superpowers. They had inspiration. They had love. They had openness. They had multidimensional experiences. So the child is really connected to spirit and really connected to our purpose in the world and the beautiful way of sharing it. Walter just uh, sent in a question for you, and I know you just said hi to Walter. I watched that in Twitter. Walter says, yeah. if we are all truly souls of pure energy, then what's the uh, relevance of the feminine force? Uh, thank you for asking that. So this goes into alchemy, and it goes in basically into yin-yang theory, 
So if we talk a little bit about cosmology, and in uh, the Asian cosmology, as in many cosmologies, everything begins with all possibilities. It's like the the great central sun, you know, it's this contained space that there's it's nothing and it's all possibilities at the same time. And then you have the first division, which creates yin and yang, positive and negative, masculine and feminine. And now you have the ability for creation to occur. When you have yin and yang, you also have the ability for energy to be created. Like in a battery, a battery has a negative and a positive pole. And it's because of that that energy is created. And so it's the same way with masculine and feminine. So if we want to talk about relationships, because I can apply this into everything. I can apply it into martial arts and many things, and I'm right now I'm applying it into relationships and sexuality in my teachings. So there's beautiful teachings inside of Taoist tradition on gender alchemy and how the, the feminine force nourishes the masculine. So what it is is that the yin nourishes the yang. So a man knows that is very much nourished by yin energy. And so in Taoist sexuality, they'll actually teach men how to nourish themselves with feminine energy. So, the, of course, the emperors would know how to do this, and this is what they were taught. So only royalty and sages were taught some of this information that's now just come out to us in the last 10, 15 years, some of it. Um, And women were taught how to nourish with their feminine force and also taught how to cultivate the feminine force. And in that way, you create a lot of energy. And qi, qi gong, energy, tai chi, energy, qi, life force energy is really what it's all about. It's very healing. It's, uh, It's very abundant. It's very protective. What we know of is love. What we know of is pleasure. This is just energy. How I often tell? Yeah, well, you yeah. know, you know what's fascinating about everything that you just said is that uh, throughout history, uh, certainly before electricity, let's back up. You know, let's back up before the 1800s uh, until now. We're talking about 150 years of. Uh, 200 years of the Industrial Revolution, electricity, TV, Internet, distractions, uh, movie theaters, whatever. It doesn't matter. Telephones. doesn't matter. But before that, all we had was ourselves. So we were able to connect with our inner selves, teach us ourselves about that, know about um, not only emotions, but the power of the mind and, and how to grow and evolve as a person. But in the last 200 years, we have developed a complete amnesia. We've forgotten about all of that, you know, that we took thousands of years to develop, not only in China, but Egypt and Europe and South America and some, you know, and, and, and that's all we had to do uh, each day was to look at ourselves and communicate with ourselves. But we've lost all of that, all of it. We've got amnesia. We completely lost it. We, we do have some amnesia. The West has never really had traditions that um, carried sacred knowledge about relationships and sexuality and high-level movement like Qigong, how to heal the body through movement. Um, it's not really a part of our Western tradition, and so we have had to bring in these traditions like the Taoist tradition, well, my beloved Taoist tradition, because so much of what I uh, do comes from that, the Qigong work and the sacred sexuality, and then this shamanic tradition, which is really kind of like rainforest shamanism. We, we have this knowledge available to us, and this is, we live in a very special time. And so what I had to do was I had to go to these different lineages that have carried the information down for thousands of years, and I had to just go in there and get the tools required for me to exist well on this planet. And I needed higher level tools because it just wasn't doing it for me, the tools that I saw laying around. I'm like, this, this isn't going to do. I'm just going to kill myself, you know, with bulimia if I, if I have to just deal with these tools. So it was in getting all of these tools that then I enriched my life. And I was able to transform that illness and not only transform it, but then to exceed and excel, to get five black belts, to become the first female master in my lineage, to do healing work, 
to develop programs that people have never seen. Uh, by the way, I just want to invite people, if you want to get a taste of what I'm talking about, about the sacred relationship alchemy, I have a special report on my website. My website is bethleone.net, and I have a special report for you guys. It's called Conscious Love Secrets for Men and Women. And um, this one in particular is how to protect the power in your relationship, preserve your love, and inspire your partner. And it's a teaching in this report that comes from these ancient lineages. So this is the kind of stuff that I'm doing right now because I'm very passionate about our relationships being right. And it just seems to me that if we, if we actually can be in loving, supportive relationships, then we will have enough strength to create families and communities that can really protect this planet. How easy is it for uh, everyone to digest uh, your knowledge? And as you present it, is it is it easy? Can, can everybody enjoy it? Yes, it's very simple. Actually, I make it very simple. Uh, do you want to? That's ta- one of the things I do. Do you, do you? You know what? That's this is what happens when we have a great conversation. I neglected the audience and I didn't open up the phone lines. You want to take some oh. phone? We, I think we should take some phone calls. You want to take a few phone calls? Yes. Yeah, let's do that. I'm going to open up the phone lines right now. Three two three eight two five five zero four five. Three two three eight two five five zero four five. I'm apologizing to the audience right now. When I'm engaged in a conversation. That's it's, it, uh, that's just the way that it goes. <laughs> but um, uh, while I'm waiting for the phone calls to uh, come in, we're on a you know a, a twenty second delay. Um, uh-huh. So, it, but it's easy for everybody to digest, and they can just access uh, the, uh, your information. And it's not because I don't want it sounds heavy. But then again, mm-hmm. if it's broken down in a simple way, really, it's just, it's nature, it's life, it's the way that the world should be. It's actually very simple. It's, uh, these concepts are quite simple, and a lot of people have, like, major revelatory experiences. I can talk to somebody, um, and in the matter of one conversation, they will never see a man or woman the same again, and people tell me that all the time. And it's because it's a shift in perception, and it doesn't take... It does. It's not complex. It's just like, what if you look at it like this? And they're like, oh my gosh, you're never looking at it that way. Well, I had no idea. And that's the power of the lineage information in our lives because, no, we didn't think about it because it's been 4,000, 10,000 years of wisdom that's been digested and brought forth. So I have that... Um, Right now, I don't have a program running for the the Art of Love for Men. It's closed, but if there are enough people that were interested, I would reopen the program. And I have a priestess program coming up, which is a six-month initiation for women. So that's enough time for, like I said, I have always initiated women into their secret practices and in um, manifesting their their spiritual path and their feminine force and all of that. So I have a priestess program coming up and. I'm just going to take a handful of women through that, uh, not very many, and so that would be by application only. And if anybody's interested in that, they can just email me. Do you have to have a, a teacher uh, through this, or is there a way to to go through these uh, the, this learning experience on their own? I mean, do you have to have a shaman? Do you have to have uh, somebody with guidance, or can they do this journey on their own? I couldn't have done my journey on my own, I can tell you that. The information that I have, there's absolutely no way I would have just figured it out. I mean, I have five black belts. Like, I wouldn't have figured that one out. All the the various forms and all the teachings that I got in this paramilitary martial art organization about how to hold the respect line and how to ask questions, how to honor a master, how to balance with major alpha males. Um, Like, you don't just come up with that. I mean, these are, these are teachings that are passed down from, you know, master to student to master to student for many, many years. So there is something very sacred about the, the sacred teaching relationship. This is the way that information has been passed on for as long as we know. There's nothing like getting it just in the darshan of it. 
Right, right. Is there a link, uh, Beth, uh, in our, uh, not only our inner child, uh, but to the relationships with our mothers? Both, both for male and female. The relationship with our mother is so potent and powerful. I feel it just colors our entire life. The relationship with the mother is key to how how we love, how we feel about ourselves, our ability to receive nurturance and nurture. And many people are, many people have so much going on with the mother. It's really big. I've done a lot of mother work. I love my mother, and my mother was manic depressive. Um, she was bipolar when she raised me and that was real and that had real effects. And I, I had to respond to those effects if I wanted to be a healthy human. And I did, I did not make it her problem. I've never, I have never made her feel guilty or anything at all. I just said, well, this is my, this is my shite that I get to make into a flower. Right, right. Do, do you do, do you have any secrets left that you haven't told your mom? Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> she's not gonna hear all of them. <laughs> uh, it's my job. Uh, <laughs> you're gonna get a phone She'll call. Hear some of them. Yeah, yeah. You're gonna get a phone call later on tonight. Um, this came in from a spiritual warrior. He wants to know if you know Master Wu. No, but that's a very common name, Wu. Okay. But I do, I do not know Master Wu. Okay. All right. Uh, let's take a quick break, and uh, when we come back after the break, we'll be taking your phone calls. This is Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Beth Leon. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. More with Beth right after this short break. Stay with us. Hey, I'll make you a deal. Give me 60 seconds and I'll give you directions to the Fountain of Youth. Okay, I'm joking. Well, we're well, kind of joking. No fountains, but youth, I got Nature's Youth and their premier anti-aging product, Nature's Youth RSF. With your sensible diet and exercise plan, Nature's Youth RSF can help you look and feel better. RSF is an all-natural amino acid supplement that supports your body to naturally increase HGH levels without any synthetic hormones. And elevated HGH levels can contribute to increased energy, improved libido, reduced body fat, and improved exercise capacity. Let's be honest, who doesn't want to look and feel younger? Visit the newly designed website at naturesyouth.com or call 800-333-6923. That's 800-333-6923 and like them on Facebook and you'll be included in contest and exclusive offers. What a deal. Oh, speaking of deals, my time's about up. 800-333-6923 or naturesyouth.com. Who needs a fountain anyway? Call today. What's up, fade or nots? Studio Dumb loves Fade to Black and the F2B audience so much that they have put together the ultimate stereo Bluetooth system. They've done it just for you. Man, check this out. The Studio Dome SBB2 stereo system is here. It's featuring two Studio Boombox 2 SBB2 wireless Bluetooth speakers packed in its own custom hard shell case. This Studio Dome system features the very latest in stereo Bluetooth technology. The two full-range boomboxes are in true wireless stereo. You've got to hear this. It's amazing. It's just $129, and use the promo code JCRTWS, and you'll also get free shipping. It's simple. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, click on the Studio Dome banner. Go Beckley Tepe. It's not a lifestyle we chose. We were.
were born this way. KGRARadio.com. This is KJCR at JimmyChurchRadio.com. All right, welcome back to Fade to Black. Our guest tonight, Beth Leong. Phone lines are open, 323-825-5045. If you're on hold, stay right there. I will get to everybody, or I will try. And uh, let's do this. Let's go straight to the phones. Hi, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Beth. Who's calling? Hi, this is Destiny. Hi, Destiny. Say hi to Beth. Hi, Destiny. Hi, Beth. Hi. I you? just want to say that everything you're saying is so completely true and that it's happened to me and it's happening so fast that it's hard to keep up with. And it's like right now I'm making up for the past 10 years that I've lost. Um, mm-hmm. That makes sense to me. I don't know if it makes sense to you. It does. Um, yeah. It's just like my inner child is just now wakening up and um, realizing things that just were holding me back and keep keeping me from really experiencing life as I should. And um, I'm just working really fast to try to catch up and. Well, Destiny, uh, just, uh, Destiny, really quick, uh, do you have a question for Beth? Um, yeah, I suppose about the inner child work and now I missed the first couple of hours of the show, which I will listen to in the morning. But what was the thing about the master? Well, I've trained with many masters in lineage, ancient lineage traditions in order to get the tools that I needed in order to heal and to Uh empower my life. Um, so with the, the inner child, it can just be, uh, you know, really sweet, you know, inviting her into your life, really. You can begin a personal relationship by just inviting her to play or maybe if she wants to, like, wear a particular dress, um, something like this right. where you're nourishing her. So in the shamanic right. traditions, we actually do soul retrievals and we bring back these parts of our children and then we create relationships with them. So also... You know, if you wanted to look for a shamanic practitioner in your area, you could start doing inner child work like that, too. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. It does. Mm-hmm. I understand what you're saying. And because um, my inner child is real mischievous and just real, I don't know, she's she's kind of messed up. But, you know, that's all right. <laughs> so I'm, I'm learning. I'm learning as I go, you know. Destiny, well, thank you. Well, that path can help heal the, the wounded part. Mm-hmm. And, and and Destiny, oh. just go to uh, BethLeon.net, and she's got, it's a great website, number one. But number two, uh, uh-huh. there's so much information there for you. And uh, Okay. And, and, and there you go. Thank you for the phone call. Thank you. Thank you, Jimmy. Good night. Good night. Hey, uh, Beth, you, uh, how would somebody seek out a local shaman? I mean, how how does that process work? <laughs> well, you can look on the Foundation for Shamanic Studies website, and you can probably find a shamanic practitioner in your area that has gone through that training. They do very specific training, so there are actual you know like graduates of their training programs, and I would start there. Yeah. Because they're very, very much accredited. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and you you brought up, you know, everybody's a shaman today, right? And and mm-hmm. there must be some type of vetting process for somebody that's real and somebody that's just out there trying to have a good time, if you know what I mean. Uh, yeah, it's just what works. So, so there, there are, yeah, the Foundation for Shamanic Studies will have some solid practitioners. There you go. Yeah. Hi, you're, you're live on Fade to Black. Say hi to Beth. Who's calling? Hi, Beth. This is Catalina. Hi, Catalina. Um, Thank you for all your information. Um, I really appreciate it. I got into, I took a shamanic workshop in 2005, changed my life, Uh, really got me in touch with the spirit. And now I do um, a different type of meditation. So it's a little different than journeying, but it's kind of the same thing where Mm -hmm. you get 
get close to the spirit. So I'm going to ask a question, and then I'll take my answer offline. Um, I know that we once were more like in a, a matriarch system, and it was healthier, and then somehow <laughs> we got into the patriarch, which has been a long time, and all the wars and all that. So I'm wondering your take on, do you see us getting balanced as being back to a matriarch or a balance of both? Matt, you know, Matt's going to send and thank you, and I'll take my answer offline. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. That's a good question. Yeah, it is. Thank uh, you. The way that I see it is a co- co-union now, and it's when both the man and the woman understand their intrinsic power, their innate equality, understand how to co-create with the sacred alchemy between each other, then it's a, it's like a co-rule. It's not patriarchy or matriarchy it's a cooperation and i feel that now we we almost need to, to come into this time where um you know women have uh, gotten a little masculinated um some of the men have gotten a little feminized we need to come back into a balance where we're both strong and we both rise up and we both uh you know come into our power together and learn how to work with each other to build each other up to protect each other. Actually, that's what my report is about on BethLeon.net. The report that I wrote, um, the concept is point your weapons out. So I talk about this concept of how to protect the love that you find. And it's an old martial art teaching, actually, and it's about pointing your weapons out. So I really suggest you guys read that. That will change your life if you actually do it. Um, So (laughs) you know what's interesting here, Jimmy? I have to read this. I I don't think David's going to mind. David... (laughs) <laughs> he texted me. He texted me and he says, Harry, this is what he says. I should talk a little bit more about how I can help men get laid by teaching them what women really want. That's from David Wilcox. Right? <laughs> oh, man. That and, and uh, David's listening right now. David, that's a that's a two parter three hour show <laughs> each. <laughs> If Beth can pull that off in a couple of minutes, uh, she should be running for office right now. But oh, uh, this is how I pulled it up. I created a course for it. That's what you mean. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So all of you men out there, just go to bethleon.net. dot uh, net. Uh, let's go back to the phones. Hi, you're live on Faded Black. Say hi to Beth. I'm still laughing. My work was done for me. Uh, <laughs> um, hi, Beth. You know this is very good to hear. I'm a little bit older than you, and I went through a lot of the. 60s stuff, um, but I also uh, just kind of stumbled into some uh, some of the men's movement, in the, I guess that was the early 80s, briefly, um, and, and it's good to hear uh, a woman, uh, you know, saying there's so much political stuff that's going on, we don't need to go there with, you know, individuals and all, but just when you live in a place, places like the Bay Area or probably New York or uh, you know, areas that have a lot of um, of energy of a new age nature and of a political nature and with different cultures, it's kind of hard to get together because there are still, uh, as when I took uh, a Wednesday weekend workshop with Robert Bly, you know who he was, um, yes. people brought up and a lot of men, like Catalina was saying, a lot of men uh, have not been fathered either. They they they're running yeah. around having children and they have not been fathered, and and so this battle it was asked during this weekend workshop, well what can we do about the women the feminists and all and Robert Bly belted out he goes what can you do about twenty thousand years of oppression <laughs> you know mm-hmm. so I'm glad to hear that we're moving I hope beyond that but I still see it in my everyday life where. It's automatically assumed I happen to be a European male and that I'm out to, like, put women down and anything I do would be suspect to an oppressive move. So I think we do have to put the sexual and the spiritual and and even the physical together and work out balance. Thank you you for bringing that up. I do, because what, what I teach women is a way of being in the world that supports the masculine and a way of being in the world that if you want to, if you want the masculine, if you want something from the masculine, let's say, there is a way that you can inspire that rather than try to dominate or control that. So these are the yin and the yang essences. The feminine has a great power, and the, the name of this talk is the feminine force. It's about remembering what the power of the feminine force is. The earth has great power. The earth receives 
the sunlight, and, and David's going to talk about this kind of stuff a lot with, with the uh, the sacred geometry and all this stuff. The Earth receives the sunlight that has the sacred geometric vibrational pattern inside of it. And what does she do? She gestates that and she pops it back out in all of life. Every tree and flower and blade of grass has this mathematical sequence inside of it. She gave birth to that dream. So wow. when a woman That's... understands the power of her womb, then it's a lot different. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I... I, I thank you for that. And Jimmy, I just wanted to say that you know, a lot of this stuff became mass popular during the 60s, and there's a, a lot of people running around now, uh, you know, putting down people from the 60s, putting down people who were born after World War II, saying they ruined the world. You know, hey, that wasn't me or my friends. We were trying to fight the power and straighten it out. And and I think as the 50th anniversary of the Summer of Love comes up next year, mm -hmm. a lot of people ought to reflect because we lost we lost Paul Kantner recently, and uh, there are a lot of people that were musicians and artists, and even Tim Leary. You know, I mean, yeah, we can criticize them, but they brought a lot of this stuff together so that people like you could practice this and not be considered weirdos nowadays. Exactly. Well, the 60s yeah, busted through a lot of things. Yeah, it, it, it did, but I'll say this. In a weird way, uh, it kind of got us off track, too, as well. And well, we needed to be off track. I mean, that's why the ETs landed. We were going way <laughs> off track to destroy ourselves. Uh, Dino, Dino, you're <laughs> the best. I just wish they'd clean up the plastic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the plastic. And, and I mean, that's the it's thing. I, I have not met an ET, but I think a lot of them are jealous because we have good sex on this planet. And Dino, with that, I will say good night. Great phone call. Thank you so much. All right. Good night. Uh, you know, and, and Beth, there's there's one thing that uh, that is standing out when we talk about um, the feminine and the masculine, and 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 children, and your and your parents, and the mother and the father. That there's one thing that's right in front of us that we're still in a little bit of denial about. And I'll say it. I'll say it publicly. The family unit, the family unit, that basic structure, that yin and yang, that that duality, that that thing that has been perfected throughout time has broken down this last 30, 40, 50 years. And Dino touched yeah. upon it, and so did you, where we have children now that are raised by the fathers or just raised by their mothers or neither, mm -hmm. right? And and that, that guidance and that basic thing that that was always there has, has broken down planet-wide. I mean, it, 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 this is something that, and we look at the confusion and, and, and the directionless children now today that, that are growing up that, that don't respect uh, their elders, don't respect teachers in school, they don't respect the police, they don't respect anybody. And they seem to have all the answers because they haven't had that basic guidance of, of the male and the female and the family unit and to grow up and, and be nurtured that way. And I, and it's right in front of us. And, and it's because our relationship broke down, our man woman relationship broke down. Yes. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. And we let it happen. Mm -hmm. And, and part of it was to allow women their freedom. I get that. Part of it was mm -hmm. to uh, to uh, break down what the male part in society was about and to separate that. And, mm -hmm. and, and, and we wanted that and, and, and we tried it and we tested it. But here we are today with a kind of like a, a, a moral fiber breakdown of our very, when I say fiber, the very fabric, the very foundation of what got humanity here to begin with. Which is the I male and female? Agree completely. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. and and nobody. I agree completely. And I'll admit it, man. There was something about getting smacked by your mom when you were a kid that that <laughs> that set you straight, right? And and mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm being direct, but that kind of thing, the guidance and and the nurturing, uh, has has gone away. It it really has. Yes, we, we haven't been, we didn't value, we're not valuing it as a culture right now, especially the feminine, so we're not valuing a woman staying at home, being feminine and doing feminine things. I call it the return to the hearth, the heart, and the home. A woman's place is, is 
keeping the hearth fire burning. You know, her power is in her nour- nourishment and her nurturance. And so that's that's really in the home. Who's at home and what's happening at home? Is it warm? Is there good nourishing food at home? Um, is there open arms? Is there love? Is there a place for the man to come and be received and be acknowledged and to regenerate and to go back out into the world and hunt? Because we have now we have two hunters. The woman is hunting. So she gets up and she goes, she hunts, she comes home, she's frazzled. She doesn't have time for the kids. She doesn't have time to make dinner. So kids are eating Kentucky Fried Chicken. The house is a mess. And she doesn't want to have sex. Right. And that's what we've done to the feminine. We're burning the feminine out. And the feminine needs to be restored. Very interesting. Mm-hmm. So I'm not wrong. <laughs> I mean, You're I, right on the money. Yeah. I, I look around and and uh, I just... It, it, it frustrates me because I know that it's certainly with my generation um, and maybe a little bit before me, uh, that generation, that, you know what, there was something about, you know, the respect that you had for your teachers at school. There was respect that you had for anybody that was a month older than you, right? Any elder, you know, you had that and you learned from them. Now, you know what, that's all, you know, that's just all gone away. Almost completely. We call that the respect line in the martial arts. There's a name for it, and it's called the respect line. And you get very specific teachings about how to conduct yourself within the respect line. You respect the person that's one, you know, one click above you, and you have compassion and care for the person that's one click below you. Because when you're standing in those martial art lines, there's always a higher belt, and there's usually always a lower belt. And there, one is to your right, and one is to your left. And there's codes of conduct. And then there's codes of conduct of how you speak to the master instructor. If you want to question the master instructor, you question yourself. You don't question them directly. You don't dishonor them that way. You question your understanding of what you just heard them say. You know, you, say, you, know, you know, so there's like, there's codes. Yes, and, and, and it's still out there, too. It, 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 one of the things that I love is when you go somewhere in the country, you, uh, across the United, you just go somewhere, and you see the biggest, tattooed, roughest guy, right, gnarly guy, veins hanging mm-hmm. from his teeth, right? And, <laughs> and some, some, some older lady comes up, you know, 90 pounds, and says something to him, and he goes, okay, ma'am, yes, ma'am, yes, ma'am. I know he was raised yes. right, right? <laughs> you know? Yes, right. And, and that's what He's I'm talking about. He's a good mama. Yes. And, and, and uh-huh. it's still out there. But in a general sense, you know, when, when, you, when you know that uh, teachers or parents today are afraid of their kids because they know that their kids aren't going to respect them or they're not going to respect their teachers or their elders around them and they'll just call the police or they'll they'll scream you know it just i i'm saying it publicly look i i mm-hmm. we can't keep our heads in the sand on this you know it's it's actual reality beth i've had the most wonderful time tonight with you on the show and uh tell Thank david you. We'll get, we'll we'll get you back, and we'll we'll talk about the men getting laid plan, and uh, we'll do that at another date. But thank you so much. I, it was just a wonderful conversation tonight, and great phone calls and everything else. Oh, so thank what's you. next in your future? What are you doing now? Do you have another book coming out? Another program? Are you doing any speaking? Yes, I'm working on a, my next book, which is going to be a compilation of all of these sacred relationship teachings and. I have to feel into how much of the sacred sexuality I want to put into it. and But it's going to be, uh, yeah, it's going to be rolling out these lineage teachings about the masculine and the feminine and a lot about the feminine because I am a woman and I've had to go through this great discovery process which, with myself, which we didn't even talk about, this um, activation and awakening process of my own body, which is an opportunity that women have. And it's uh, most women don't even know about it about what those bodies are capable of. And, and I'm really passionate about that because it really changes the way we feel <laughs> and right. the way we feel with each other if we know about this stuff. And so my next book is going to be sharing that. Um, traveling, um, continuing to work on my Art of Love program for men, I love that, and the priestess process. So I've got a six-month priestess program that I will take a handful of women through the priestess process. Um, 
your spiritual process, your, your holy cause, your sacred work in the world, your sacred sexuality, um, healing work, recovering the magic child, you know, working with the mother wound, all that stuff. And everything is over at BethLeon.net. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Beth. Wonderful conversation. Be safe out there. Tell David uh, that we all said hello. Thank you so much. Okay. All right. You got it. Bye. Thank you so much. Beth Leone, everybody. BethLeone.net. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com, and you can click right there. Great phone calls tonight, today, Uh, everybody. Thank you for that. Now, I want to um, – look, uh, a quick wrap-up with my own thoughts on this. You know – I and I've been outspoken about this on the show in the past, but I, I, you know, I hold uh, family and friends so dear. And at this point in my life, friendships and new friendships are rare. But putting that aside, the one thing that we all have is our family, you know, and 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 I try to teach this to, you know, my two daughters as well. But I talk to my friends about this. And 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 Beth spoke about this tonight in depth, which is and I, th- I find it so important that the family unit, that 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 very fabric, that the foundation of us all has indeed broken down. And if if it breaks down individually in 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 those small and it and it continues like that, well, that's society in general. And we really need to stop and think about that. I think now, today, that the vast majority of us are in denial about it. We went down the road. We tested the waters. We put our toes in the water. And you know what? It's just, it's not working. It's not working here. It's not working there. It's not working anywhere. And if there is a way we can just get back and appreciate our elders, our mother, our father, the feminine, the masculine, what nature has perfected for us. It worked out a certain way for tens of thousands of years. And then we just can't come along in the the late 20th century and just decide that there's a better way. <laughs> it just does, it doesn't work that way. I, you know, things have broken down. And, and the way that Beth uh, lays it out for us, trying to get back and trying to get centered, it's, it just makes sense to me. There you go. All right. That's my take. And I'm going to stick to it. Uh, A couple of things that I've got to get to really quick before we get out of here. Check this out. Mars needs you. That's right. In the future, Mars will need to take all kinds of explorers, farmers, surveyors, teachers, but most of all, you to Mars. And you can join NASA on the journey to Mars as they explore with robots and send humans back there one day. That's right. I said there, back there. You can download a Mars poster right now. You can be an explorer. Go to my Facebook page or our Facebook radio page for the links. Now, I don't know about the message, but the posters themselves are very cool. And you can download all of them high res and the links are there. I did it today. Uh, uh, I posted a couple of them already. And speaking of Mars, not that Mars, Mars candy bars. The one-time maker of king-size chocolate bars, remember the the king-size version of everything, is now considering taking its M&Ms out of sugary dessert treats, including McDonald's McFlurry. I'm not making this up. An industry source familiar with Mars thinking said that the company has had talks with the largest fast food chain, McDonald's, uh, and other partners as well, about the candies that are included in their desserts. The elimination of M&M's, which contain 7.5 teaspoons of sugar, by the way, about a third as much as a large McFlurry, right? The M&M's themselves are a third of the sugar in a McFlurry per serving. It's just one idea on the table. Also under consideration with McDonald's and other partners are recipe reformulations. Mars is concerned, and this is where it gets whack. Mars is concerned that desserts that feature its candies 
such as the McFlurry, Burger King Snickers Pie, and Dairy Queen's Blizzard. And, you know, at this part, this is heresy. This is sacrilegious blasphemy because I love a blizzard. Exceed in a single serving the amount of sugar the U.S. government recommends anyone eat in one day. But I got to tell you, if you're going to go, <laughs> if you're going to go to McDonald's and go all in with a Big Mac, then you got to top it off with a McFlurry. I mean, if you're going in hardcore, you're pushing your chips to the middle of the table, then I think you deserve a McFlurry with M&Ms on top. Yeah. All right. Today, China banned exports of technology and materials that might be used in weapons production to North Korea. Yes, they finally pulled the trigger. This is in response to Kim Jong-un's development of a nuclear arsenal. Now, at this point, you're going to think I'm making this up. But Beijing has long supported the North Korean government and the country, and it's most important. It's the country's most important trading partner. All of the money that comes into North Korea, well, if they haven't stolen it from an online banking network or through uh, slavery, right? All of their money comes from China. All of it. They have no exports. They have no food. They have no farming. They don't build anything. There's nothing there for North Korea to make money on. So all of their money comes from China. And for China to pull this trigger is amazing. In March of this year, a UN Security Council resolution, by the way, it was resolution number 2270, had levied new financial sanctions on, on North Korea. Not only that, but all all boats, anything, anything floating now gets checked out. They can't sell anything. There is no, there is no trade internationally anywhere around the world with North Korea. Imagine that for a second, right? The North Korean leader has since intensified all of his nuclear activities, and he did this in defiance of all of the imposed sanctions. Every time we ratchet, there's nothing, there's no further that we can go with North Korea. There isn't. There isn't another level of sanctions available. The list of banned dual-use items with possible civilian and military use includes now metal alloys, cutting and laser welding equipment, and materials that could be used in production of chemical weapons. That's what China has done starting today. There is nothing left for North Korea. There's nothing. I can't imagine what it's like to live there now. There's no money. There's no food. There's no nothing. And now China has cut them off for any dual-use products. Unbelievable. And it's about time that it's happened. Maybe, just maybe, we'll see a turn of events in North Korea. Thank you, Beth Leone. Fascinating conversation tonight. Touched on all cylinders for me. Thank you so much. Faded Blocks executive producer is Rita Kamarian. Show is produced by Hilton J. Paul, Mark D. Kovar, LJ3, Renee, Mark Dunbar, Jonas. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Bob. Announcers are Steve Harder, Gene Vitoa, Mark D. Kovar, Fady by Dale. Webmaster is Drew the Geek. Music, Doug Aldrich. Intro, Space Boy. Fade to Black is produced by KJCR for the Game Changer Network. Syndication, KGRA, The Planet. Thank you to Beth Leon. Thank you to everybody that called in tonight. Her website is BethLeon.net. Just go to JimmyChurchRadio.com. Click on her name. It'll take you straight there. This broadcast is owned and copyrighted 2016 by Fade to Black and the Game Changer Network. It cannot be rebroadcast, downloaded, copied, or used anywhere in the known universe without written permission from Fade to Black or the Game Changer Network. I'm your host, Jimmy Church. Follow me on Twitter at JChurchRadio. Tomorrow night is Fader Night, Open Lines, and John Rappaport is going to be here with his No More Fake Newsroom. Until then, I want everybody to be safe. Go Beckley Tappy. Tappy.